recording. It is 1.30. We have a quorum. We'll call a meeting to order. And just for everybody's information, the, uh, especially people might be watching this on YouTube or whoever, that the term, the, the term, the company, uh, there were three companies that were submitted uh, proposals to be interviewed today. EDM Studios, Helene Carl, and Weston and Samson. EDM uh, withdrew late after yesterday. We heard, we heard about it. And the reason they withdrew was because they had a project that was on the back burner or not going to occur. They were notified that they would get the order. And so they decided that was too much for them to handle two projects. So they actually withdrew from ours. So it wasn't anything to do with anything we're doing or otherwise. It's just that uh, more work than you could possibly handle. So good luck to them. So at 2 o'clock, we should have um, Helene Carl here. And then at 3 o'clock, Weston and Samson. And we have our questions and we have our rating sheet. Anybody have anything else to talk about before we start to get the people here? Um, as far as the rating sheet, we want to use the rating sheet. The This is the rating sheet that uh, CMF gave us, Neil, um, as a possible. Do we want to use it as this? Do we want to use something else? Um, any questions or comments on it? Seems reasonable. I say to use this, right? Okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. I, mean, I got no questions on it. We, we had our questions that we went over um, two weeks ago, and we don't have any minutes yeah. from the meeting because Randy uh, wasn't here, which is fine. And so we have our rating, our question sheet. Those questions and the Weston and Samson uh, report were emailed to the prospective designers last week. So hopefully they will be incorporating a lot of this stuff into the pre in, yeah, into the uh, presentation that they make, much like the old PMs did when we talked to them. We'll see. And as we're going along, we will act accordingly. Mr. Neil, have any comments he wants to make to us? No, I think we're good. Good. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, everything to the to this point thus far has been very straightforward. I think the responses that were provided by the architects were thoughtful and complete. Um, so we'll see how the presentation goes. And very interested to hear the committee's feedback on all points have, that have been received in the interviews today. Okay. I think that's good. Do, do we have copies of these questions? Anybody make them or not? I made a couple of copies. I think we all want to if I have some. I'll go off not. the office and have some made if we need them. So this thing's here, right? Yeah, those yeah. Those, yeah, I got them all back and back and forth. We'll make copies in the office if you have Oh, 11, right? It's the final so on the letter. Yeah, 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 a lot of right. questions, right. I, I need one. I need okay. One. So, as you, you want two copies yeah. for each yeah. Janet company. Okay. Anybody else have anything else to talk about till the people get here? No? Okay, how about if we just uh, suspend the meeting instead of just wasting time talking for the next 10, 15 minutes? Can you put on pause? Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have the people from Helene Carl here. We will reconvene our meeting. And for everybody's information, I'm Jim Maximus, the chairman of the committee. Gary Berg, he is the maintenance man for DPW, maintenance facilities maintenance person. Scott McCarthy is the DPW director. Dave Phil is a member large. And Tom Quinlan is the building director. And I'm also a member large. Okay. And then we have, you know, Neil the guys, Joyce, CMS. Construction Monitoring Services, Tom's OPM. Scott Luke here with CMS. Civil. Great. And the meeting is being recorded. Okay. You have to watch it on YouTube if you want. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Does it take 10 pounds off you when you want to watch my needs? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you look right back. Great. Okay. Just for clarification to committee, um, CMS and Helene Carl Architects are engaged with our municipalities on current projects. Um, so just in the, in the case we are not putting, as I understand, one way or the other. So I just want to make everybody as aware of it. There is a distinct relationship there. Okay. Okay. I'll say, floor yours. 
Well, thank you for having us today. My name is Greg Yanchenko. I am a principal at Helen Carl Architects, and with me today is Mike Vienna, who will be the project architect for this project. Next slide. So today we've prepared about a 15-20 uh, minute presentation and we'll uh, try to address most of the questions that you uh, ask or we received the list from Neil on. We'll give you an introduction of the design team and our philosophy on how we approach this project, our understanding of the project for um, Hadley experiences and lessons learned that we've had. We'll show you some design concepts, I and mean, these are just concepts to initiate a dialogue and then do a quick summary of our uh, qualifications. So Helen Carl Architects is a uh, Samba certified, uh, excuse me, SDO certified woman of business. We offer the range of architectural services as well as what we call um, design management. We, will, we provide these services to both public and private clients. And we believe our ability to successfully manage both large and small projects is um, evidenced by our repeat association with many of our clients. Uh, we've worked with Eversource for 32 years. We've worked with Fitchburg State University for over 20 years, Town of Rotten. And we have many um, clients that we've worked with for several uh, decades. By purposely limiting the number of projects in the office, we can give your project the attention it needs. And we're a smaller firm, but we do, uh, we're very selective on the projects we go after because we do want to give our full attention. And so this would be an important project for us. Next slide, Mike. I can see by the organization chart, and I believe it was in our proposal and two, we have the full complement of all the disciplines necessary for the, uh, the product. We've been working with all of these consultants for over 20 years. Many of them have done uh, a lot of the DPWs that we'll be referencing. We believe that the combination of our team's uh, resources provides the attentive services of a small firm and the integrated services of a large firm. And HKA's approach to staffing ensures that the individual team members are involved through all phases of the project. So you will see me um, at the beginning, you will see me at close now, and we believe this is important because it maintains continuity. Next slide. All right. So to just highlight quickly kind of our approach and everything. Um, we believe the key to the uh, design process is listening to you, the owner, and what you're asking us for. We will push back, we'll give you some suggestions stuff, but ultimately at the end of the day, we listen to what direction you would like us to take project. Uh, we believe it's important to both balance both the technical as well as the aesthetic aspects of the um, the project. Again, as I said, you know, we believe that this is a successful approach by the fact we've had a repeat association with many of our clients. We work closely with our clients to develop the conceptual, functional, and budgetary aspects of the project. We place an emphasis on uh, and stress three components in this, scale control, cost control, and quality control. As I said, as far as staffing, individual members are assigned at the beginning of the job and they will be the ones closing out the project. So you'll see us from uh, inception of the project to close out. We define the roles very clearly on each of the consultants so they know exactly what they're responsible for. And then we maintain a constant dialogue with you, the owner, as well as the team and the OPM to make sure that all the scheduled deadlines and everything are uh, met. One of the critical things on all projects, and you, unless you tell me there's an unlimited budget, you know, most towns, you know, most of our clients, public or private, are always very concerned about the budget. And we believe it's important to set uh, expectations early on in the project. So once we get the initial concept done, we will start pricing this up. We develop a cost model. And as we go through the design process, we uh, adjust the cost model so that you uh, understand what the implications of the base design decisions you've made. We believe that this has been a fairly successful process because we're usually about uh, within 5% plus or minus of, you know, the bids, sometimes we're a little open, sometimes we're, there are a few outliers and everything that occasionally happen, but that's just the way it goes. One of the things that we do with our cost model, um, because we've done numerous DPWs, we have firsthand information on the schedules of values and stuff, so we were uh, estimating if it's pretty accurate on the DPWs, as well as we've owned another company called Bid Docs, and that allows us to take a look at a lot of bids that come in. So we can kind of gauge that and then the, we uh, do outreach to the contractors we work with to make sure that we're hitting the right numbers. Because again, that seems to be a very important, in addition to the program, very important aspect of any project. And then finally, we um, 
quality control. We use experienced personnel who have functioned in a variety of roles. They've been designers, they've been contractors, you know, they've uh, been an owner's rep. And um, that is how we try to make sure that we can all the basic and ensure that they uh, uh, ends up being a successful project. Next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so uh, I can give you a quick overview of our firm and our team. What I'd like to do now is kind of zero in on Hadley's DPW product, okay, and how we believe our related experiences uh, makes us qualify for this project. Um, basically, in very broad terms, we understand that it's an existing DPW. Some of the structures will probably demolish, others, you know, maybe renovate and stuff. Um, we know that you'll be building a new DPW. Obviously, the program will make the determination on the size and everything. And then we understand that you're in, I'm going to say, uh, loosely an environmentally sensitive area because you do have two rivers and with river fronts and everything. So we are aware of that. We understand that the program will include what you see on the screen, uh, vehicle storage bays, repair bays, wash bays, shops, administrative spaces, employees, salt shed, fuel island, and again, the site development for utilities and parking. Next slide, Mike. Um, this is a very quick slide, and uh, I will not go through all of it because I'm sure many of you can read this, and it came out of pretty much what I, we understand of the uh, RFP. So this is the schematic design phase, concept schematic design phase. We would um, do an assessment of the existing conditions. We would review the current program that you have developed any further that would need to be done. We would then bring out our engineers and specialty consultants to do a site assessment and the engineering analysis. That would typically include like warnings and things like that. We would develop some concept layouts. Uh, once those have been kind of refined, we may develop two or three options. I'd say like this, this, and this. We then kind of uh, put it together in the schematic design layout, prepare renderings, as well as a cost estimate and a proposed schedule for that. I believe in the RFIP that you send out, you're looking to award the contract on November 1st. The design submission for the SD is due in March. Goes to the meeting, if funding is approved, we're anticipating if that is the case uh, between May and January. And again, we can accelerate that schedule if necessary. Uh, but we always find that bidding around holidays is not a great time to bid, but bidding it out early in the year, because a lot of contractors like something to have on the books for the spring. Um, we do like contract award in March, start in April, and we anticipate this project will take about a year to complete. We're also very aware that the fee was quite clearly stated in the RFP as well as at the uh, briefing. It's 120000 That's all in. As you'll know, we would be carrying our geotechnical consultant as well as the hazmat survey on there. And based on the briefing, we understand that the to uh, topographic survey and the wetlands delineation has been um, carried by the town. All right, this slide is one. All right, um, one of the questions was how many projects have we done? That is a list of the DPWs done, about 15 DPWs, and what would we call similar projects? You may be familiar with Greenfield, the Franklin Regional Transit Authority. Basically, it's a bus storage as well as a vehicle repair shop. And same with some of the other ones, Gatra is that way, Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant, these are service centers, uh, Mass OT, Bridgewater, and then as you notice, we've done a lot of work with. Uh, Every source at their service centers and stuff. So all together, we have about you know 30 projects on our belt that we believe make us uh, qualified to do this. All right, Mark, let's start getting in. So now what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through some of our projects very quickly, uh, just to give you a sense of what they are. And if I'll stand up on this. So uh, this happens to be the Boxford DPW, very similar to approach to what we've taken on this. We were first retained to do concepts and schematic design. Um, we put the package together, they went to the meeting, got the initial funding, they're splitting it, they're not going with one uh, number, for, but they split the design, and now um, they're working through to get it approved for um, the construction funding at the uh, spring down meeting in May. Um, this is a kind of complex existing DPAW temple and stuff, and they're kind of taking in the back area here. This is a big landfill that they built everything on. Uh, they're wetlands, slope areas, so we're very familiar with uh, challenging sites and everything. This just tends to be a larger um, blow up of what the planet, the DPW structure, which is about 23,000 square feet. They have a fuel island, they have salt storage shed. They're introducing brine operations as well. 
and the parking and associated stuff. Next slide, Mike, please. This just happens to be a layout of the thing. Uh, they have about uh, 20 vehicles, five vehicles that they uh, need to do with accessory equipment. Uh, they have they decided to just go with a single vehicle repair garage because they don't have a mechanic. Um, but we encourage them to put it in you know, initially, and then when they do get their mechanic, next slide, Mike. And then that just happens to be a rendering of it. So what did we do? We did the study design uh, of it, 23,000 square feet. Um, has a similar program to what you're talking about, estimated at $19 million, which comes in about 75 a square foot. I mean, it will be public bid. We're going through all the um, public hearing processes there. Next slide. Okay. This is the FRTA that I mentioned to you. Um, this is in Greenfield. Again, I'm showing this, I'm not worried about aesthetics or anything, but just give you an idea. Of it. This is their bus store. You'll see that. This is the office area. This is their garage area. We are now working on a phase two, uh, put solar on a panel on this. Uh, again, this gone through all the processes and everything. This is uh, in about $13.5 million, about $500 a square feet. One of the challenges here was built on a kind of landfill, so in a suitable soil, so we had to go through all of that. The next one, that's just a slide. Again, what they chose to do is this is where they queue up all their buses. These are full buses, these are the small buses. And they decided that they weren't able to heat the garage for the buses. They just throw them the buses or out in weather and they weren't shoveling snow and everything. Office area, employees areas like breakers and stuff. And then they do have a uh, full mechanic space because they do a lot of work for the area. Next slide. Okay, Hudson, as Neil mentioned, we are working with Hudson on that. Again, this is in their municipal complex. That is the uh, new DPW. It has a fuel island vehicle canopies. Uh, they were doing their own separate salt storage. Next slide. Um, this is about 34,000 square feet. It's coming in about 588 a square foot. Um, they have a much larger office component than this that you have, but again, they have the same requirements, shops, vehicles, and stuff. The reason I'm also showing this, you see, we, we have sketch once we get into the concept of ways they can approach this. This has a uh, three bay garage. Next slide. That just happens to be a rendering with. Next. Uh, Whitman, again, this is a project that we were working with uh, CMS on. Next, Mike. Again, this is a slightly different approach on vehicles. And stuff. This is what we would call stacked or tandem parking. Uh, they have um, uh, four bays for garage, office area. Next, and that was about uh, 30,000 square feet. I believe that's kind of in about uh, 691 a square foot. And these are all relatively recent numbers. Next slide. Uh, then, just to kind of wrap this up very quickly, this is the Medway PW that we have. This is net zero, um, and it has been certified as net zero. Again, another one, another one of these challenges like wetlands right across in the hill cemetery next door. And so we have pretty much any kind of configuration and site that we've needed to do next. And then a, a, you know, a little smaller, uh, more modest one. This came in at about $4 million, and this was you know pre-pandemic. But it, just to give you an idea, we will work with you on the aesthetic you want for yours. They wanted to feel it, make it feel more agricultural, kind of like the atmosphere that the in the area that is in. So we tried to pick up a lot of a barn look for them, and they seem to be very pleased with that. Next slide, Mike. So at the end of the day, it's great that we have all this experience. We always ask, ourselves, what did we learn from this experience? And um, how can we make our future projects better as a result of this? So one of the first things we talk about is the uh, programming needs. And we'll ask you to identify and work with you on and your staff to develop, you know, what kind of workflows you have. How often do things happen and stuff? Because a lot of people will latch onto something and they're building something that they only use once a year. We can make arrangements so you, you can get more flexibility out of the uh, facility and stuff. And yeah, all of this makes on surface sound very easy, but we do believe that there is a you know a need to go through all of that. And we would ask you, you know, um, think new and not what you have, because I know a lot of you, uh, the DPW directors, work in old facilities and they. Um, you know, just make do and fabulous about that. And I we always use it like use a quote that, you know, if and this is from Henry Ford, people ask what they wanted, they would say they want faster horses. And I'm sure you just want a better DPW garage that works for your need, not just a faster horse. So that's how we approach it. 
So the mobile view is we'll talk about service vehicle versus private vehicle access to site and circulation, circulation of pedestrians and um, vehicles on the site as well as within the building, storage requirements, deliveries, um, interior versus exterior canopy storage. Uh, if you integrate any contractors into your facilities, because some of the facilities that we work with, they bring in um, during storms and stuff contractors and they have to look in and stuff, and we work through that, as well as any technologies. Next slide, Mike. The technological front, um, obviously, the bill has to work, and that's the critical. Uh, so we need to get a bill, it needs to work for you, it needs to be low maintenance and everything. So we will develop solutions like that. So the things that we've learned, we encourage you to put a 40 inch high knee wall around your building, both interior and exterior, because we've seen panels go all the way down, they rot. I tell the one story about the Uxbridge DPW that we did, they insisted on running the metal panel all the way down. They said, this is not a good idea. They had an intern moving in lawnmowers on day one. The intern drove the, uh, or summer help, drove the lawnmower through the back of the building. Then they had to put up guardrails and they lost space in it. So things like that we've learned, so we say do that, we talk about personnel lockers versus platform lockers. And what we mean by that, obviously, in the locker room, you need a locker to change your clothes and things. But a lot of times, through our Eversource, what we've learned that they do platform lockers where they're slightly longer so they can keep some of their wet weather gear and all that other stuff that they use on a more uh, periodic basis. But it has some place to put that in. We'll talk to you about heat systems and what's the best approach. We'll talk about the lifts, how you would do wash bays. One of the things we do in wash bays, and you'll see in all of them, we make a wash bay pit with a grate on it, with a pit that takes up to the pit, because we bring these trucks in and stuff, you hose them down, wash them down, you might wash off a ton of sand. And if you just put them in a standard drain, um, it clogs and drains it. So putting it in the pit, you pick the grate out, scoop the sand out when you're done, and you do the process all over again. We'll talk about the fenestration. One thing we'll tell you, and you'll see, we highly recommend you don't make any of your doors less than 14 by 14. 14 feet high, 14 feet wide. We've done 40 foot high, 30 foot wide door, and they still hit the jams. And now, <laughs> that is the uh, So those are just some basic things that we'd say. I know you may have a smaller fleet now, I don't need it, but what happens when you get that one larger vehicle and stuff? You don't want to be, you know, adjusting doors and stuff. Obviously, this is a critical operations facility, so generators and things would have to keep it as well as, um, you know, exhaust and everything. Next slide. On the logistics, again, this is something that we'll sit down and work with you on. Um, you're on an existing site. I'm uh, anticipating, unless you surprise me, that that site will continue to operate during construction. So we're familiar with that. That's something that we would work with you on. Um, We'll be coordinating the site access testing, and I'm talking about not only just design, but during construction, we'll work through some of those plans. We'll be coordinating utilities, because there may have to be some phased approach to keep the existing operations up and running, while also bringing in the new utilities for the facility. Uh, we'll coordinate with you on the bidding schedule to see what is the best time so you can get the best price. That's why you saw on my schedule, I'd say put it in January, February timeframe, when the contractors are looking. Well, you put it out in December, you will get some interest. Everybody's, you know, pretty much checks out December from, you know, that's been our experience. And then we'll also uh, work you on any available funding and stuff. If you decide to go, say, like with a net zero or something, I know Faye in our office has got millions of dollars in grants. In the case of Medway, um, we got them about $1.5 million um, in grants to help them offset the cost of their solar panels in it. Next slide. So now I'm going to really start getting into the of this. And what I'm going to do is I'll show you this slide and talk about a couple of concepts you develop. And I do want to understand they are just kind of to initiate dialogue. We're not saying this is right or wrong or indifferent, we're just in making some of So what we learned dealing with all of these uh, DPWs is one of the biggest challenges is the vehicle search. Because unlike people that can turn on a dime and everything, some of these vehicles need you know, the proper turning system. Um, as you probably noticed, because I noticed in your um, current operations, trucks are getting bigger, not smaller, and that's why I see the back end of your back truck hanging out of your board. And obviously, it was never designed, but nevertheless, the trucks are getting bigger and bigger. So what we kind of learned is there's a couple ways of dealing with these things. This is what we call the stack parking and cross aisle. Now, we notice that we put a tandem bay here. Why do we put a tandem bay there? Two regular, like 10 wheels, could park in there very comfortably. But when you get that back truck or you get your second back truck or whatever, 
it can now take that space. So you're not rebuilding your garage. You have take large vehicles, small vehicles, or any combination there. Uh, usually that's seasonal uh, equipment move in the back portion of the pan and then it goes to the front. On this side, we'd say, you know, do a single, you know, bay. Bays are usually about 35 feet deep, so you can park a truck with a plow. But what we'd also encourage you to do is put a travel aisle, a cross aisle for you. Why do you do that? Well, clearly, if I was put a lot of pickup trucks here, I can pull a pickup truck out of there very easily. Can't pull the vac out, can't pull the 10 wheelers out. But I can do that very easily, as well as some of the small lawnmower equipment and stuff like that. And the other nice thing is a storm's coming tonight. You need a prep and everything. You can queue trucks up in that center aisle so that they're prepped and ready for the storm. So that's what we call the stacked and cross aisle parking. This now is just straight up strapped, stacked uh, parking. And again, three bays, it gives you big trucks, small trucks, and combinations thereof. And then this is what you've might seen in a lot of uh, garages as well, is the, the two entrances and diagonal parking. Okay. Again, all of these uh, plans have their advantages and disadvantages. We would say that you should probably do a combination of parking, because even in this diagonal, and you notice that we tandem base here, the reason being is because the vac can park a bit. And you probably don't have a lot of large vehicles, but you, you probably will have some. Or if you need a truck with a trailer on or something. So that's how we kind of approach this. So now we're going to get into your specific project. And again, these are just concepts for uh, to start the dialogue and then we can um, get into more details next. Okay. So you're all very familiar with your site. Connecticut River here, the other river here. I understand you just purchased this property with the house on it. You have your salt shed there, storage there, fuel island existing, and the wastewater treatment plant. Clearly, the wastewater treatment plant is fully operational. It's not going anywhere. It looks like it's in good shape and everything. You probably can't see it that well, but we put on the lines this kind of um, magenta polish line right here, and you kind of see where my finger is moving around here. That is the 200 uh, foot setback from the rivers. So that means we're basically building in this kind of triangular location. Now, um, we have to address the, the wetlands, we have to address any river front, we have to address all of that. You have some neighbors that obviously you want to be sensitive to, but most important, this is, this is an existing uh, operation. Next slide. Now. So what we're proposing is there's a couple scenarios, and this is kind of based on the FRTA project that I showed you, the bus uh, maintenance, office, garage, vehicle storage there. As you can see, it can sit in there very comfortably. The big move that's going to happen first is and again, we will have this discussion. The, so, the existing salt shed will need to be taken out. So what we're proposing is putting the existing salt shed back here. Because that could be like a phase one move, depending on the time of year and stuff, so that you're not running the operations without salt one summer. You move that back there. This existing garage can stay in operations, the fuel island, as well as this. Now, there is obviously some construction here and would make it a little challenging. But again, that's something we could work with you on. I kind of put the yellow line around the wastewater treatment plant saying that's off limits because you're not going to be doing anything there. So in this case, you put the new facility up, get it built. We propose the fuel island here, pulling it off. This is, again, another one of the discussions we would have with you. Some of the towns and cities that we deal with, everybody fuels up, police, fire, and everything. If that's the case here, then we should talk about how we can get trucks and stuff in and out without having to necessarily impact all of the operations. Um, I know a lot of them like to put it up front because a little, again, it's an aesthetic thing that we will work with you on. I'm not sure the neighbors like to see a fuel, fuel island there, but we will work with you on that and, you know, uh, do what you um, direct us to do. But so basically you could have one entrance in here, one entrance in here, loop around, parking up front for like um, employees and visitors and stuff. The disposition of this existing building. My understanding, built 1970s, 1975 time frame, um, um, blocked, unreinforced, no insulation. Um, it's probably not worth renovating. However, having said that, if you put the new building here, get rid of the trailers, clean this up, this could be excellent cold storage. And so that's something that you may use, you know, put a coat of paint on, put some new electric in it and stuff, but maybe you don't heat it or anything. It's just cold storage because i yet to find a DPW director that doesn't need additional storage for whatever. So, or you could just say, take the building down. And that is, again, something that we would work with you on. 
Next slide, Mike. So that's option one, as we call. This is option two. This is based on the Foxford uh, DPW thing. Garage at one end, parking in the middle, office at the front. As you can see, it has a different impact on site. But again, the salt storage would have to go out. We keep putting the salt, uh, the new salt shed back here because we were looking for putting it here and here. While this is partially disturbed, the fact that you had to cut any trees down and stuff, you're probably not going to get a lot of support from the DEP or CONCOM or anything else like that. This area is outside the buffer zones. It's already been disturbed. So this could become uh, an ideal location for salt storage. You would also get your ramp for loading and stuff. But again, just a concept. We'll be happy to have that discussion with you. In this case, we kind of minimize the frontage on the street, which may be a little more sensitive to the neighbors. Maybe it's not a concern. We'll work with you on that. Trucks would pull in and out this way. You still have the cross aisle there, and you can get the uh, operations to work. And again, whatever you decide to do with the existing building. Um, next slide, Mark. So um, basically, that is our presentation to summarize why I think we're qualified for doing it. We do have extensive experience working on DPW facilities. Uh, we have the dedicated resources and personnel to ensure continuity throughout the design and construction process. We have uh, proven experience with cost control, schedule control, as well as quality assurance during design and construction. Uh, we have um, extensive public experience. We've done over 175 public legal projects. Um, we will bring the attentive services of a small firm and the integrated services of a large firm while maintaining design excellence at reasonable cost. So thank you for giving us this opportunity to present our presentation. At this time, I will be happy to address any questions you may have. Questions? Anybody have anything? You, you, you showed a spread of uh, price per square foot. Yes. Was that because of they just like a car, they just kept adding options or? No, so pre pandemic, you were getting a DPW for around three to four hundred dollars a square foot. Mm -hmm. Okay. When the pandemic kicked in, everything went crazy. Generators were late, switch gears, and everything else. Um, right now, if you were asking me to budget your thing, not even if you know what your scope is. I would tell you you should be budgeting uh, 700 to 750 dollars a square foot. It okay. doesn't mean it can't come in lower, but just to be on the safe side, that is what they're coming in at now. About 700 dollars a square foot. You all can do the math as quickly as I can. 20,000 square foot building, you're looking at about 15 million dollars to just I'm talking hard costs. You throw in the soft costs, you throw in FF and E legal fees and all of that, you're probably adding another, you know, um, 10, 15 percent on top of that. So uh, a 14 million dollar job will probably come in around uh, 17, 5, 18 million dollars. You know, again, don't know exactly what size um, garage and you know, vehicle storage and stuff, but based on what I saw when I was out there, you seem to be in the ballpark of where Buxford is, about the same size towns, about the same operation. That was, a, they got there down to, ideally they wanted the 26,000 square foot version, but, you know, they voted to have the 23,000 square foot version because it took about a million off of it. The thing that I think you have in your advantage over something like a Boxford, a Boxford or any of these other sites we're dealing with, your site seems relatively clean. And what I mean by that is, there's no landfill under there. Um, I'm assuming there's no buried oil tanks or not, but you don't know for sure on that. Um, the site's flat. Boxford, they're doing a million dollars worth of fill coming in to fill the side of the slope. Okay. You don't have that problem. You, know? uh, you have water and sewer there, which is spectacular because now you don't have to worry about perks for uh, septic and everything. So if you were to ask me right now, I would probably say, off the top of my head, I would budget around the 16 million hard costs for you. So you're in that 23,000 square foot range or something. And then with your soft costs, where I believe you could probably bring this under $20 million, the whole package. Again, I'm just you know, kind of estimating on that because I don't know if you need four garage bays or two garage bays. I don't know if you want lifts or no lifts. Do you want an overhead grid? Because I get um, Montague, which Neil and I worked on, they wanted a 20. Um, 20 ton crane to lift whole bodies of trucks off filled with sand. 
never made sense to me, but that's what they wanted, so that's what we gave them. You know, um, things like that. I don't know what you currently use for your fuel. Um, are you talking 4,000 gallons of, you know, between the diesel and like 2,000 gas, 2,000 diesel? Is that a, a manageable uh, volume for you? The uh, fuel islands are coming in about $650,000. And I know that most recently because we just did Hudson and we just got the quote and everything. So they're looking at about 650000 Some of the other DPWs, they want larger tanks. So then you could be approaching like, um, you know, $800,000 for them, depending on what you want. So those are the things that we would be working. But right now, like I said, based on you went with something like a box word, I would say you'd probably be in about the 17, uh, uh, 16 to 17,000, uh, 17 million dollar range for that. Again, just, you know, estimating at this time. So. We went and looked at the uh, modern U facility because mm -hmm. it's close and we're just uh, size wise. I'm just trying to picture these numbers. Mm -hmm. How many square foot is Montague? Yeah, so um, Montague is about 30,000 square feet. Now, what's really interesting, like, can you flip back to FRT? Yeah. So Montague is about 30,000 square feet, 29.5 or something like that, but let's call it for 30,000. Um, all in when that project, and that was pre pandemic, okay, it came in at about um, eight million, slightly under eight million dollars. Okay, this building, which, no, this is I want to So, this is the Franklin Regional Transit. Right over here, where my finger is, less than a quarter mile away, is Montague. Okay, same designer, same uh, contractor, same site. Essentially, because this is an industrial park, this one came in at eight million. This came in at thirteen five. Okay, same size buildings. Now you can say, well, that has extra glass and stuff. That's not a you know five million dollars swing because of glass. It's just that's the way life. Both sites were basically the same. Uh, Neil remembers we kept digging out soil and shifting soil around and everything. This had the same problem. Yeah, so. That is the jump that happened probably within a two-year span, three-year span. Since that time, the numbers keep going up. Now, I hear things are beginning to soften a little. The numbers may come down. I would not tell you now to budget a 30,000 square foot building at $13,000, unless you want to strip a lot of things out. They decided not to heat their uh, vehicle storage bay. Fine, that, that saves money. It's not going to save millions, though. And that's what I guess we have to work with you on to see where you want. If you had a guess, what do you think it would cost to build that Montague building today? The Montague building today, I'm going to guess it's going to probably come in about twelve million. All in twelve million. Well, when you say all million, I'm talking hard costs, not us costs, but hard costs. It's probably twelve million dollar building today. Most of the most of the stuff another fifty, so be another three million dollars of action. Right. Right. Check your math. Did I two to three? What's fifteen percent of the uh, twelve? Yeah, twelve million hard cost. Yeah, thirty thousand square feet. That's four hundred dollars a foot. No, I know, but he said Montague. Okay, yeah. now understand with yeah. Montague. Montague was pretty much a um, just a big shed, you know. And you Neil, know, again, this, I'm saying I know what you're saying. I I understand. I'm just yeah, and I I so setting an expectation. I, I expect that. Very okay. careful. I I. I you would, but he asked me what that is. So Neil is correct. And again, I first I'm going to start like I said earlier, seven hundred dollars a square foot. Okay, whether that trans, you know, lays specifically for Montague or not. But if I just had to guess, you, you know, that's what I'm saying. It would have jumped easily from the eight million to twelve million, and I'm probably wrong. Yeah. So you thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Uh, but for purposes of the planning, I'd say plan seven hundred dollars a square foot for now. When you're saying that, is that with cranes and lifts and wash bay? Yeah, well, so the, your basic operations, vehicle storage, office area, locker rooms, um, mechanics bays and stuff. The equipment, each of the garages that we do, like, uh, well, you can, no, you got it, sorry. With that. Okay. So this happens to be the uh, Franklin. Uh, can you zoom in on that? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay, there. Perfect. All right. So they have four bays. As you can see, they had a, like a four post lift here. Um, they had two of those. They had one bay with the portable lifts. And then the last bay had an in-ground lift. 
Okay, so there was a whole combination of lifts and stuff. Lifts on average, from the bigger lifts and stuff, are running about eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. You know, all in when you put them in the ground and stuff. Do you need that? I don't know. A lot of the uh, garages usually they use the two post rotary lifts that can pick up most of their trucks. I think you have one now. It's probably in good shape. In that case, I would relocate that like you did over at Medway. Just relocate your rotary if it's in good shape. The other thing they're moving towards is the uh, portable lifts where they synchronize all four of them. You pull them up, they lift it and stuff. And for the most part, that works. What I would say is they're working on buses all the time. So it made sense for them to have an in-ground lift. If you're working on your back truck once a year and you can't do the basic stuff, I would say it'd be cheaper to send it out to a place that can lift it and do what it needs to be done to service it rather than build a base specifically for the back truck that you're only going to service um, where you need a heavy lift once a year or something or once every two years. I mean, if you're doing the wipers, the oil changes, yeah, that would happen in here. Those are the kinds of things we would have. So when you're asking me the question, um, most of these garages that I'm quoting you on, uh, like this one, the 13.5 that this came in, included the in-ground lifts and these uh, other lifts. Okay. We do, we're just doing Gatra, which is the uh, Greater Attleboro and uh, Taunton Regional Transit Authority and stuff. They chose to buy all of their equipment off a state uh, contract. Okay. So that then when they could get that, you know, slightly cheaper and stuff. Much smaller building, only 8,000 uh, square feet, and that's like $6 million without all the equipment that they're buying. So um, for the most part, those numbers I gave you would probably get most of the equipment you want. Maybe not all of it, but most of the equipment, the compressors for the wash bay, things like that. What does a wash bay roughly run? Uh, I can't give you an estimate on that, only then I can tell you it's, Seven hundred thousand dollars a square foot. Okay, okay. Because Mike, if you go back to just fair enough. Well, well, no, but see, the, the funny thing, and everybody keeps asking me about this. Okay, this is pretty dumb space, and what I mean by that, it's got a roof on it, it's got a slab on it, and overhead doors. Pretty basic, some lighting in here. This area is pretty intense because you have locker rooms, plumbing, fixtures, all of that. So when I say this seven hundred dollars a square foot, I can't just say, oh, here's seven hundred dollars. This might actually come in at, you know, 450. This might come in at a thousand dollars a square foot. We really don't break it down that way. And then obviously, you know, you can't say, Oh my God, 700. Well, that also that when I say those numbers, that's including the site development for your parking and everything. So I would have to give you a, a detailed estimate to break this out and say, this is for this part. This is for this part. Typically on a project like this. Um, and again, I think you guys are going to be at the lower end. It's about $3 million to do the site. Just to grade it, pave it, put the utilities in. That's what we're running about now. Okay. You guys have a better site, better utilities right there. You might come in lower. Okay. Um, you know, the fuel line. Do you want a big tank, 10,000 gallons? I would say keep it under 10,000 because you trigger other things. The 4,000 gallons um, is good enough, 4,000 each, 4,000 split tank. Because one of the things in at Gatra, we're putting a 4,000 gallon split tank in 2,000, 2,000. And they're thrilled with that. That may not be adequate for you. you know? so, um, so the best I can give you is it's a rough square footage cost of about $700. And things can vary depending on the specifics of the site and program. Do most places put in wash tanks? I mean, wash bays? Which is required by law now. Oh, it is. It is. You cannot wash trucks out outside. Right back. Okay. So the, the wash bay mm -hmm. is that an automatic thing, or do the guys have to go around with power no. washers? So what we do um, in this case, yeah, what's it? Can I go back to um, Oxford? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So wash bays are an interesting thing. Wash bays are used a couple times a week, three times a week, or something. In some cases. Like, um, you'll see, we will build a dedicated wash bay because the people wash your truck so often, they want a dedicated wash bay. In the case of Boxford that doesn't wash your uh, uh, vehicles as much, we turn part of this cross aisle into the wash bay. So this is a little platform that come up. They have some equipment here. So they pull the curtain, they spray the truck down, wash it, drive it through, pull it out, whatever they want to do. Do you want to build space for, quote unquote, a wash bay 
if it can double as a travel club. Well, Oxford chose to do that. You know, some of the other uh, organizations we do, like I think Hudson, we have a kind of a dedicated wash bay. Yeah, um, dedicated garage bay. Yeah, yeah, Medway. Because ultimately, somebody's going to park in there during the night. Certainly, they're going to park in there during a snowstorm. No doubt in my mind that they're not. So um, those are things that we would work with you and say, hey, we only wash our trucks once a week. Yeah, during the snowstorms, we wash them every time. But we're okay with a shared space to do that. Yeah. But do these automatically spray? Mm-hmm. We, have done, our- we did that at the Littleton um, Water and Light Department. Problem is, is they're expensive. They usually are not maintained properly uh, because people abuse them. Okay, And in their case, they were spraying ceilings and everything. Just wasn't worth it. So most of the garages we go with now just have a handheld wand. You know, they sometimes they put the hose on the top so they can spin it around and be a click. But we've only put in in all these wash bays one automatic system. Uh, the other thing too, I know what Gatra. The only difference is they have the little push carts like a Zamboni that has a big brush, and they just walk down the side of the uh, bus to wash it off that way. So we just try to make you a wet environment. The, the, uh, the space that can take a wet environment. As you can see, there's the big pit here, so that all the sand ends up there and not in your drain system and doesn't fall in there. The other thing, you know, like Oxford, we had a long discussion with them about how do you heat this space? You know, you've seen the gas unit here, you've seen infrared, you've seen electric. Hey, if you ask me, the best way to heat the vehicle storage as well as the definitely the service space, I'm saying definitely do the service space. Is put radiant floor heating. The initial cost is a little higher, but at the end of the day, you have an eight to twelve inch thermal mass that can hold all this heat. Um, as I always say, I can heat the air, but when I lift this door, I put a fourteen foot hole by fourteen foot hole in the a building. If I open this other one, now I have a cross ventilation and stuff, and it takes a long time to heat up the air and stuff. Where at least the thermal mass it might be at sixty, and then may drop to like fifty eight, and then you can warm it up pretty quickly. I know over at Montague, uh, Tom loved it because he would park his trucks in and probably within 10 or 15 minutes they were dry with the snow dropping off of them and everything. So, again, that's just something we would work with you on. Don't remember if you guys have gas at that site. No. Okay. So then you would either have to decide if you want to go electric. Um, I know propane, people always throw out propane or oil. Montague had an oil. I know most of the other places have gas. We did do a uh, propane for the um, Bridgewater. Problem with propane is there's a certain size that it's propane tank. After you get to a certain size, it becomes a propane area, so it doesn't become a bomb and blow up half the you know the town or something. And I'm being somewhat facetious about it, but it does trip other regulations and stuff. Um, on the other hand, talking to our mechanical engineer, it's going to sound crazy with the radiant floor heat. Potentially an electric boiler can work just as well because again, you're not having these high fluctuations and quick demands. You know, the water goes out, say, at like 80 degrees, you know, 90 degrees. It does its little loop, comes back maybe at, you know, 70, 75 degrees. So you're just warming it up again and then you're sending it through the, the system again because of the thermal mass there. So um, some of our clients are looking at using electric boilers. First choice would be tell you use a gas boiler. But if you don't have gas here, then you have to just decide if you want the oil or whether you want the propane. And the oil is slightly more to clean. Um, over at Franklin Regional, they're doing all their heating with pellets. With pellets. <coughs> not recommend that. <laughs> Would not recommend that at all. But they insist in. The mechanic over there says, I love it. And they're beautiful boilers and stuff. Um, <coughs> and I'm not sure I would. There it is. So you can see our little pellet topper there where it goes up and stuff. How, how about um, air curtains? Do you guys ever install those on the Yes, and I would just take my gun and shoot my foot before I put one of those on. Okay. We did them at Revere. They're a freaking nightmare. Mm-hmm. First of all, they don't work well with the doors mm-hmm. because you either have sectional doors or, over, or coil end doors. Um, That's not it. <laughs> The year that we built uh, Revere, I want to say we were dealing with the air currents for about four months to get them installed, how you sprinkle around them and everything. And at the end of the day, they really didn't even work that well. Okay. So. 
Do you have business cards or something? I do. Could we have some business cards? Uh, I will. Just keep... we get the right spelling of your names and everything. Oh, it's a good Irish name. Yeah. <laughs> I can well, tell. Well, we always do. Guy, people ask me, what is that? I go, it's Irish. Really? I said, yeah, we dropped the O to shorten it. It used to be O Yanchenko, but we dropped it. So, <laughs> um, yes, let me, um, well, I will do it after the end and make sure you get okay. business cards. Yeah. And your first name was? My name is Greg. Oh, Greg. Yeah. Greg. And I think you'll also see the proposal by spelling them. Oh, up. oh, that's right. You're right here. Yes. Right. That's us. Yes. There we go. And that works right. And if you see anything familiar, I happen to know the woman that owns the company. Oh, you sleep with the boss? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Mike, don't hear that. Don't hear that. Okay. I Mike always thought I got special treatment. Mike, you didn't hear that. You do not hear that. Yeah. Or is more fun to work. <laughs> <laughs> this joke you know that. But, you know. but yes, I do. It's not, to answer works. your question, I, yes, I do. It's not really a joke. I, <laughs> I would hope so. What is that like? <laughs> and she is also a registered architect. Okay. So everybody in the company is a registered architect. Uh, Mike, I don't know if he, there he is. He's right there. Okay. Pronounced like Vienna, like the city, but not spelled the same. Well, the secretary of the yes, I'll take a note. That's oh, okay. I want to make sure. You're not putting another job, I hope. No, 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 he just didn't make it to that. No. Looks like Bill's a really good deal. Anybody else have any questions? Comments. Very nice presentation. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. You've answered all the questions like you see on here, which is why we give them to you so that we don't have to do that. Um, if you get a chance, and I can put you in touch with um, Mike Peralt over at FRTA, you should probably go take a look at the FRTA building too. I know it looks probably a little more modern than him. I can give that one slide. I know it. But I will tell you, there are some features on it that they absolutely love. We could probably, and we have since toned down just a little bit of the glass, but having something like the glass like that in the garage phase, the mechanics love. Yeah, we were actually talking about that before you came mm -hmm. and looking at your, just in general, the, next the, slide, Mike. the glass. I was just, you know. See, there it is. I mean, yeah. we only turn the lights on because of photographs, but you don't need lights on in that during the course of the day. What about in the winter? Well, so, you know, you get radiant floor heat, keep the heat where the guys right. are. Okay. And again, the mechanics are like the, I don't know what you call the guys. I, they're probably all called mechanics. Yeah, but, yeah. but the guys that drive the truck, the vehicle repair mechanic, they guard their space. Okay. During the summer, nice fall, beautiful day like this, those doors will be wide open. Guarantee you they keep those doors shut constantly. And when you get in there, you better drive in really quick and close that door really quick. The guys that are working out in the vehicle store, they'll leave the doors open all day, winter and everything. So um, it, it really comes down to how they want to manage their space. But we've not heard any complaints with that. But we have heard a lot of positive things. And we'll also see if you go back to um, Medway. Um, we did a similar treatment on Medway. We're doing a similar treatment on Hudson. Um, and Whitman. Whitman, yeah. Um, again, there's their lighting for their garage. They all love it. Um, they say it's some of the best mechanic space. Ever. And those guys are typically in there all day. Yeah. I don't know how your mechanics work. I don't know if they're on the road or not, but 90%. I say 99% in the shop. Yes. Does that add much to the cost of the building? No. No, I mean, look, at, I know it adds. I, I, it does it, you know, say it adds 100 to $200,000. I mean, they say, well, that's not much. But when you're looking at, you know, a $20 million, $18 million job, it's not the big driver, but what it does for the overall experience in the building is phenomenal. Um, go to Hudson, please. Uh, one of the things that typically happens is the uh, admin people and people in the office get shortchanged. And I'll let Scott and Neil either confirm or deny this. Uh, this happens to be their admin wing. When you stand in there, it's just, it's beautiful to have all the light there. And it's just in general, everybody is. And the, the funny thing about it is, 
you guys are an important asset to the town. You know, you're a first responder, you do all that. Yet you guys always seem to have the worst space in town for some reason. And so I said, when you have a chance to build new like this, give everybody what they want. They just want to be normal people with, with windows. They want to have light. They want to have good ventilation and easy air without going crazy. You know, so um, so that's what we try to achieve with all of this. Yeah. Very good. Yes. Okay. I feel like we should go out for a beer or something because it looks like we got done early. Okay. <laughs> you stand with your brain. You stand there. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's nothing else, uh, thank you. We appreciate it. Um, yes. And do you have an idea of when you think you might decide when this is happening? I know you're looking to get November uh, first contract, which mm -hmm. is not a problem, but that means you're going to decide tonight, yeah. tomorrow. We next are time. hoping to decide tonight. Okay, great. After the last interview, we're hoping to review and make a decision. Excellent. Then we got to go to the board of selectmen because we're just an advisory committee at the term. We don't have appointing authority, if you would. Right. Okay. Yeah. But their next meeting is. The first Wednesday of November, we could get on the agenda, and we would have hopefully approval at that point. How many do you need? One for everyone. Does anybody want a card or? Yeah, one, you have a check. Hmm? You have. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't want to because I, I'm not opposed against going to the Franklin. Do you want one, Neil? You know where to get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're going to have myself for life, here we go. So what is your shape? What is it actually? Like? It's Ukrainian. Ukrainian? Yes. You didn't buy the Irish part of it? No. I'm Polish. <laughs> it's funny how many some people believe it. Oh, I believe. No, I know about that one bit. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. That's Thank you. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm here. Um, I'm over. We're doing it. Is the camera suspended for now? Um, I was waiting for her to say that. I can do that. Until we get the next one. We talk about it on the camera or off? Off on camera. Okay. I, I, I think we should discuss it. Sure. I mean, that's sure. what we that's what we originally talked about, right? Because we said 15 minutes. For yeah, because we lost yeah. about 15 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah. So that way it'll save time at the end. Yeah. Um, then we can compare, but at least we can yeah. make points that we yeah. like to put this guy. Otherwise, yeah. 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 I mean, I thought the presentation would, would hit, hit all the points. I'll just speak, I'll just speak my two cents first. Um, their experience is certainly there. Um, I kind of like the idea. I mean, relatively speaking, that they're a, a smaller firm. You, you, you're not a. You get to know them. They get to know us much, much more likely. I mean, you would with any of the people, but it's just like the decisions are locally made, as opposed to what they what they say is basically what they do. You guys seem to be straight out, honest with everything. Um, Scott. Uh, yeah, I thought so. I mean, uh, one thing I, I will say that, you know, I, I personally didn't like was how he talked about the wash bay. I, I think not having the automa the automation aspect of it was definitely going in the total wrong direction for us. I disagree with that. I, I don't think we need necessarily all the bells and whistles. Of some of the wash bays that we saw, because we saw, you know, from the bottom to the top of the wash bays. Yep. But I, but I think that undercarriage Carriage wash is huge. is huge, and and then like the mechanics aspect of it and the wash bay aspect. So I want to think like a little ahead, just not for the DBW, but for the town. Uh, obviously, the firemen are looking at a three million dollar ladder truck. I think it would be good for us to make sure that, you know, they can come through a wash bay. So we're helping out the whole town of Hadley. I mean, they're making some pretty big purchases here of, 
iron that need to be maintained. Uh, I mean, they they rinse, they wash out with a hose. I mean, eventually that's coming to a screeching halt here, just a matter of time, yeah. where where you're gonna have to wash inside. So I think we need to make those considerations that we need. You know, we own you know a ladder truck that needs <clears> to be, uh, you know, cleaned off and the undercarriage wash, even if it needs to be maintained. I know they do a lot of their maintenance, but how much longer with the growth of the fire farm are they going to be able to do that there? Are they going to need to use our shop to, you know, get things into it? I'm just kind of like thinking town, town, not necessarily DPW, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think just the huge one was that wash bay. I, I did not like hearing that. I, I think that. I, I think he was stereotyping, yeah. stereotyping other experiences. I mean, I, I will just, I will offer that for all of the work that we've done on DPW projects, there have been multiple directors that have come back to us afterwards and said, we took it out way too problematic mm -hmm. for what it's worth. So I will I will absolutely support whatever decision this committee makes. I strongly encourage you, go see one that's been installed, preferably that has a track record, two, five, ten years, however long. You can find the longer the better. Ask them the troubles that they've had. Ask them, you know, get, do your homework and pick the right system for you. I agree, hundred percent. Good, good program, strong to have. But I don't think you got to spend a lot of money to get an undercarriage wash system in the wash bay. Whether it's manual, whether it's you know you throw a valve on the side of the thing and then drive through it and it sprays up and then you turn it off. Um, I, I don't think he's talking automatic in the automatic. Yeah, no, he's talking. I think you Scott, can spend I, as I, much don't, as I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean just put words in his mouth, but he's yeah. talking about the ability to wash this, wash this, even if you're going to turn a valve as opposed to a drive through Jiffy Lube, if you went right. Well, yeah, kind of. I, I just think there, there has to be. Some kind of undercarriage wash. I mean, we have one of those undercarriage that wash things. Terrible. That, yeah, that's not even worth having. I mean, you yeah. might as well just go to garden halls. I mean, from what I saw looking at those other garages, but then again, as Neil said, they're new. They seemed, the guys that had it raved about it. Just that one guy is like, obviously, yeah, you need it, but as far as the wands and this and that, you, you can cut off all of them. The bells and whistles you don't need. Yeah. We need bare bones, but we need the right bare bones. Yes. Right. Good point. Right. Yes. Right. If anybody yes. can wash with a hose, gravity's going to take it right. off. It's the stuff that's underneath that's right. got to get you. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, 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 and I know, you, Gary, you were on the phone. I just want to, like I was thinking, too, outside the box, not just for DPW, but for the town. You know, Mike's buying this hundred a million dollar ladder truck. Oh, yeah. It'd be nice for him to be able to access yeah. those guys. Well, those other towns. Yeah, I'm just saying. You know, just, you know, we we need to think about that also. Oh, absolutely. There, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Just yeah. washing any vehicle. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Washing the outside won't take much. Right. But to wash the undercarriage of any of these rigs is all of near these, impossible. All of these salt trucks dump in between the frame rails, spread in between the frame rails, and up under the frame. Right. Yeah, and you I don't care how flexible you are, what kind of a yoga class you took, you're not going to get your hands and get it all out. Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess you know any businesses that have a uh, undercarriage wash uh, station built that we could visit that's maybe five years old or more. Um, or could you get us something? Yeah. What I what I would recommend, and this is just this is me. I would find out. I would ask you folks to do some homework. Pick out a system that you think is going to ma match what you want. Yeah. We'll figure out how to purchase it, whether it's through a distributor or uh, a sales rep or whatever. And then we'll ask them for locations that that system has been installed. Well, that and then we'll so set that, up. And that would be actually part of the design either, process. Oh, either yeah, a visit, by like the outside, Zoom call, if it's yeah. not convenient, you know, we'll find out where they are. Okay. And then we'll give you guys the ability yeah. to ask your well, questions. Holden had that one. That Whatever was pretty was. decent. Yeah, that was all brand new. Well, it's yeah. Well, well I'm here I, now. So that yeah. guy I know yeah. that went with us on the tour. He still works. I'd like to. Oh, uh, I'd like to reach out. Oh, it's hey, right. just yeah. connection. Just yeah. say how, how, how is that? Washington? So, so we we actually have 
the, the gentleman that was the clerk of the works, the town of Holden, they, their clerk worked directly to them. He now works for us, and he's in us. Okay. And he knows both Preston and Samson, as well as the people in Holden. So I can have him contact them, get a deal for it, and if it looks like something we'd like to look at, bit of a ride, but it's not yeah, about, just like we went out there, we went out looking all and looked at. We went yeah. and we went on tour and looked at it. It's just like there was some stuff they're holding that was, you know, over the top of like, we we don't have the pocketbook for that obviously, right. but there was some stuff I'm like, oh that's pretty cool. And one of the other thing I like there too, where contact where they have the the outside one where you can hit like they have say an inch and a half fire holes outside but it's got the containment whatever where you knock off you know the tractor that's been out bombing through the mud we yeah. you knock off they have stuff you're not bringing that into the building i, I thought their conspect over there was good i it's think that fun. yeah i think the idea is is what you can't do is not collect right the effort. right which i don't know if that's going right. to cost you more because you're trying to collect something in the cold and it's going to freeze and understood get expensive right? put pros and cons right, right. to both to both ways but that's Sort of the idea is you can't just dump it on the pavement and let it yeah, flow right. to a basin unabated. You've got to collect it, pre-treat it, and then you can. Yeah, they had a pad there pitched into that center yeah, main just, hole yeah. drain. It was like, but yeah, so. Winter couldn't, I don't know how that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's maintenance to that. Up. Yeah. I just I just like the concept over there. And then obviously that the guy there, I forget what the garage was, where he went with all the propane tanks. The guy with the big beard. Five. Yeah. Propane, five thousand. Yeah, propane. Yeah, days. but he's the guy that was like more bare bones in the wash bay. That, yeah. You know, uh, I, I, you know, as far as a pressure washer goes, I don't think you need all that fancy automation, hose reels, right. etc. For the thing, you, you need a pressure washer pl plugged into electricity, or whatever, somewhere we can grab the holes and do the exterior. We don't need. You know, six wands, you know, three yeah. wands, and inside yeah, right. and everything. You need, yeah. you need, I mean, I, like I said, I think it just needs to be designed for us properly. And I, yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I, I really think we need some kind of undercarriage. Yeah, no, I, however, I, that's absolutely, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, like, like, Bill, my 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 experience working with uh, as a diesel mechanic on trucks. I remember going to various. We did a lot of road calls actually to fire stations. And one of the things I saw at the fire stations on their trucks, I got to crawl under them in the winter, is gobs of not ice, but salt built up underneath oh, yeah. where it couldn't get off. And you could just see the rust. They, they actually had special brake cans in some of the fire trucks because of the rust that they were so prevalent. And they were spending small fortunes to do some of this stuff to avoid rusting. So if we can wash it off. It has to be washed off. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, on the lift aspect or whatever, I don't think I'm a big fan of the portables. I think that's going to be more problematic than us than it's worth. Either the, the drive-on in-ground or the, you know, like that other one we saw, the ramps. I just think, like, in a storm or something, say if hydraulic clothes blows underneath or whatever, and they got to crawl underneath there. You gotta set up all the things, blah blah blah. Get it up in the air. This way, you just drive on the conventional rack. You lift the thing up. You do your work. You put it back down, and you're off to the races. I think the for us, the portable lifts just the portable maintenance on. It's gonna cost you more than what's that? The portable maintenance on one of those portables is gonna cost you. Yeah, I, I just I just think the calibration. Yeah, I think the standard lifts is what we need to. Okay, I've been thinking about that, and I. Just think it's going to be better. Yeah, we don't need yeah, four lifts. We need, you know, the, the small one we have is like four or five years old, maybe. Most. Yeah. Like, uh, but it, it, you're talking what one big lift for the uh, trucks and then maybe portables for uh, that for a second? Because no, just a regular two post lift like we have. I mean, I, I hate to say, I hate to say it seeing that this other garage isn't going anywhere. I would suggest keeping that lift in there and active. You need a third lift or whatever. It, it's there in the yeah. garage. And, yeah, it's set up. It's, it's set up in there. Well, guys, I was just talking about the wash bait. 
in that long center travel way. I didn't think that was a good idea. I'd rather see a maybe one way bay or in and out that would double up as a truck storage that in one of the heated area. I'm not for heating all the area for the trucks. I think they can be brought in under cover and plugged in block well, heaters. But. The other problem too, and the good thing with the radiant heat in Montague, and in, we have a learned how to have the fire station too in the bays. It's like he said, when you come in and say you don't get to wash the trucks that night or stuff, when you can dry them off underneath, the radiant heat drying them up from underneath is... I mean, well, Montague spent, I asked the guy in Montague, he said they spent they burned 600 gallons of uh, number two heating oil to heat the place one winter. Yeah. That's all true, Gary. But what I'm looking at at the very beginning is to get this past that town meeting. And the town meeting is the easy part. Then you go to a paper ballot to get it passed so we're not just wasting our time here and spinning wheels and coming back four years in a row. Somewhere there's going to be a lot of stuff that what's more important, a good wash bay lifts or all the trucks being in heated areas. I, I think those are great points to make, but I think some of those are, we're, we're putting a little bit too much of the car before the horse. Okay, Let's talk about the presentations that we're listening to and what the good points and bad points are as opposed to what we would like to talk about once we choose, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. so that we can just get the talking points of the two, co two companies compared, hopefully make a decision pretty quick and then Okay, bring them back in, and we can beat the heck out of them <laughs> with well, all of the that, other things. Well, that was the only thing I didn't care on because okay. that presentation was. Yeah, that's fine. I watched it like that. Yeah, I agree. That I agree with both of those. Yeah, yeah. But I thought they were small enough, and he seemed open-minded enough to later on we'd be talking about that. Yeah. Because if he, one of the complaints was who you allow to drive through there, and if you've got a spot like you're saying a drive-through, mm -hmm. and I want to say who they had mentioned, but like. Whatever department you you know you have it available, how do you limit certain ones? Remember that one of them got hit once or twice by the certain department using it. So you think I think just the spray under the water and everything, you're just gonna make a huge mess. Yeah, 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 it down. needs to be contained in that building. Yeah. I did like his idea of certain things that they learned over what have you learned? Right. And he had some very good points, like, you know, a block Four wall is high. Wall, yes. Do this, do this, do this. A lot of things we've already talked about, what we would like to see yeah. kind of mirrored what his right. thoughts are from experience because, you know, you guys speak from experience too. You know, what you've seen, what doesn't work, like the metal wall to the floor. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's less expensive for sure, but 10 years down the road, you're going to have a lot of rusty bottoms. Yeah, the first the first time when somebody like doesn't hit the snow plow square that's in front of it and you push it, it's gonna go right through the wall. That makes to me one hundred ten percent sense. I, I you know, we looked at the most of the garages we looked at had that anyways. Yeah, yeah that's you, you can't really have metal. That's where it's gonna get hit. Somebody's gonna hit it and it's gonna be game over, but the concrete yeah. you, you're gonna know you hit something. <laughs> yeah, it will. You down. Not to say that they won't damage it, but at least it'll take a lot more. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Fellow okay. two? Yeah. The other guys have one? Yeah. 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 Grab them. And two miles. Let's set up. Oh. I'll just let the cameras right now. Thank you. I'm going to very quickly start it. We're ready to run. Yeah, one of us? No, you better run. Putting technology in my hand is not a good We appreciate your honesty. You'll keep track of the time and keep track of it. We're going to hear, I'll introduce everybody here. I'm Jim Maximoski, the chairman of the DPW committee and a member at large. Gary Berg, who is part of the DPW, who's the facilities maintenance person. Scott McCarthy is the DPW director. Dave Phil's a member at large. And Tom Falkman, I'm Tom. Okay. Tom. Okay. So, Clint. <laughs> yeah. Very cute. Yeah. Is the building inspector. Excellent. Scott Luke here with CMS with our interpreter. Neil Joyce with yeah. CMS. Yeah. See you again. I'm, I'm not wired to stand. Recording it. 
It's being, okay. it's being recorded on, and it will yeah. be available on YouTube if you want to watch it afterwards. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, we went. Okay. Um, thank you. We'll do a little more formal introduction in a moment, just very briefly. I'm Dan Tenney, a principal uh, architect, and uh, I'm technically lead of, lead of this team. And I'm just going to say hello and thank you very much for having us here. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, think hard about your project and talk to you today about uh, what we understand, what we think we can do to help you with it. Um, we appreciate the questions that you sent um, earlier in the week, and I think our presentation today will cover all of the information and more, but by all means, if you think we've missed something or you'd like more information, just chime in. We don't have to, you know, just talk at you for, for a half hour. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Richard and let him uh, formally introduce you. <laughs> uh, th 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 thank you, Dan. Um, we this we we're going to talk to this agenda here today. Uh, we we have uh, I'm going to start off with team introductions and experience. Um, I'm going to start out talking about our approach, but then I'm going to team, uh, turn it over to our team members. Uh, then we're going to have some closing key points that we want you to take away from this presentation, um, and then we'll have questions and discussions. We reserve that spot at the end of this presentation. But as Dan said. Please uh, jump in if you have questions. We don't want to leave any stone unturned. Uh, we want to make sure you're confident in your decision as you move as we move forward. So um, this is the team chart uh, that we had submitted on. Uh, here's some of our key team members. Uh, my name is Mike Richard. I'm the discipline lead for facilities group. Um, I have I'm an I'm a professional engineer, nearly 30 years experience. Um, Dan Tenney. As you mentioned, he's the principal architect on this job. He's got a little more than 30 years experience. And then we have our project manager, JP Parnas. JP uh, spearheaded the feasibility study report. Uh, JP comes to us with, with uh, 30 years experience. 30 years on the nose this year, by the way. Uh, Della Donahue is one of our architects. Uh, she's gonna be uh, leading our design team effort in terms of the architecture side of the work. And then we have Jesse O'Donnell, a professional engineer. He's going to be leading our civil design effort. And uh, Jesse has some real practical experience or real experience, very similar to what you're going to see on your, your site. And Jesse's going to talk to that when, when, he, when he's up. Um, but this is the team that you'll be working with on a routine basis. We have other members of the team that will come in and out. Um, it's a very, you'll see during this process, it's very interactive. Uh, the HVAC, mechanical, electrical folks, they'll come in, they'll sit with you folks. We'll walk through different systems, different options, make sure we got the system that you like. But generally, these are the folks that you're gonna see. That's our team. So I mentioned before that I'm the discipline lead for the facilities group at Weston and Sampson. Uh, Weston and Sampson is made up of six different divisions. Um, we're one, we're the smallest division in Weston and Samson. We're made up of 40 staff, more than half are architects. The other half are civil engineers, industrial equipment engineers, and administrative staff. 90% of our work is dedicated to the design and renovation of public works facilities, but the rest of our work is mostly municipal facilities. You can see a listing of some of the work that we do there. Um, what I'm always proud of is this photo in the bottom left. That's our team going back to tour one of the facilities that we had completed. I think at that point it had been in operation for four or five years. And we go back and we tour our facilities from time to time. We take the whole team there and we sit with the operators of that facility. We try to hear what they like, what they would have done different, um, so that we can take those lessons learned and bring them to your project. Um, some of the things that make us unique is we're specialists in what we do. Um, our team has experience and program in more than 150 different facilities, um, 42 of which have been constructed in the last 14 years. Uh, we also have six additional ones that are in construction. JP himself has been involved with, he's been the project manager for eight different facilities that have been constructed. Um, but JP is a team leader, so he has had involvement with additional facilities uh, that we have completed and gone through construction. Um, we're a New England firm. We're based in Massachusetts. We've been around for 125 years. Our client base is minis minis municipalities, right? So, um, but we are Massachusetts based. 
and most of our work is in Massachusetts. We know Chapter 149, we know the procurement, we know the bidding requirements. Um, and what also separates us out from the rest is we're industrial equipment experts. Uh, our folks will come meet with your folks. I think they've already done it once, they'll do it again. We'll make sure that you have the right equipment, right de-icing, right shops, anything that you need for your operations, we'll make sure that it's right size for you guys in your operations for years to come. Um, Something that we're pretty proud of is, is that we have the ability to do most of this work in-house. Um, some of the things that are gonna be very important, especially in these initial steps, is permitting. Um, you're located uh, in between two rivers, right? Um, geotechnical, that same geography, what we have found before in the past, um, you know, sometimes can lead to uh, organic soil and organic soils that have to be dealt with. Uh, sometimes it leads to soil conditions that are subject to liquefaction. So we've seen that before in other jobs that we've done and we've dealt with. It. So um, I talked about our industrial equipment. We also have sustainability and resiliency if, if, uh, if, if that's the path we go down. Um, in our architecture and space plan, I already talked about the 150 different projects that we programmed. We will go out, how, out, of, how, out of house is cost estimating. We have the ability to do that in-house but we think it's advantageous to you folks if we get a third party opinion. Uh, can't underestimate, especially with the volatility in the market these days. Um, we'll start off, I'll talk a little, about, little bit more about our cost estimating approach as we go through these slides. But the reality is we have the ability to do in-house, but we find it advantageous to go out-house for the cost. So the project approach, um, every project is different, every client is different. Um, but there's some common themes that we try to implement on all our projects. Um, one is we want to listen, right? That's something that I think a lot of designers have a hard time with. We want to listen. We want to know what your needs are. Uh, and we want to know what's important to you. And our challenge is, this, this actually came from one of my architects, our challenge is to deliver what we heard of, right? That's, that's the fun part about what we do. We take what we heard from you and we need to deliver. Um, but we recognize that this, you know, a public works facility is once in a lifetime, once in a generation for most of us, right? Um, we want to make sure we get it right. This facility has got to last you for at least 50 years, if not more. We want to right size it for you guys. We want to get the right program. And we'll talk about how we get there in these coming slides. Um, the way we look at this initial step is it's like building blocks in a way, right? Um, each step builds upon the next one. We want to go through a review, a review and confirmation. We're going to go through concept development, schematic design, total project cost, and funding. And we'll talk about these in the coming slides. We're going to start off with the project kickoff. Uh, it was actually kind of funny. I got a document from a client uh, the other day, and it's what we expect from our consultants. And they really downplayed the kickoff meeting. And I thought that was kind of unique because we hold the kickoff meeting is very important, right? The kickoff meeting for us is something where we can talk and we can say, this is our understanding of the scope. This is our understanding of the deliverables. This is our understanding of the communications. And we all want to be on the same page as we go forward. So while it might seem like a very minimal task, for us, it's, it's pretty important. It kind of sets the framework for everything else that we're going to, we're going to be doing. Um, in this also, what we talk about is our project challenges, right? We want to stay ahead of that. It's, challenges sometimes can be a negative word. But I mean, that's why we're here, right? There's, there's challenges to getting this project complete. We want to stay on top of this. We want to identify the challenges and we want to address them so that they're not a problem later. So it doesn't result in a problem later. We want to stay on top of it and, and, uh, and deal with it up front. So some things that we identified for your project is the temporary or continued operations, right? You have public works operations there. You have a wastewater treatment plant there. You have salting, which is part of your public works. You have fueling, which is town water, right? So that's something that, how are we gonna deal with it? Um, continuing access to those continued operations. And then we have the site constraints that, that Jesse's gonna talk about um, and, and construction costs. Big one, right? That is something that we're dealing with all our clients and how we're gonna tackle that, right? We wanna be in front of that. We want to be aware of these costs. We want to stay ahead of that so that there's no issues down there. So the review and confirmation is something that we also hold out, right? 
right? You said, well, we just went through a program exercise. Why do we want to do this again? Well, it's been our experience that each step along the way, as this project becomes real, you stop looking at it a little bit different, right? So we want to make sure that we sit with you and we go through, this is what we heard. Is this still true? Your operations could have changed. I think there's some question about the fuel line. Is that still an operation? Are you going to continue operation of that? Do you have more staff? Do you have more vacancies? Do you have more responsibilities, different vehicles? We want to go through that with you to make sure that what we're going to build upon is accurate. Now that you're on, Jesse. Thank you. Mike. Talk about some of your site features. Yes, thank you very much. So as Mike said, my name is Jesse O'Donnell. And as a civil engineer, I'd like to talk about several of the site constraints and how those constraints will impact and guide our design decisions. Um, so uh, in the aerial image of the site we have on the screen here, in the magenta line, we have the property boundaries. And the property is made up of three contiguous lots. You'll see in the, the southerly lot, it actually spans across to the, the west side of the road. Um, but in terms of the first constraint that I'd like to talk about, we have in red the property setbacks, or the, the building setbacks. So the front yard setback right along Middle Street is 50 feet. We have 15 foot side yard setbacks on the top and bottom of the screen, and then a 40 foot rear yard setback to work with. I'd like to mention the existing wastewater treatment plant in the north central portion of the site. Um, the treatment plant is in operation and will continue to be in operation right throughout the duration of, of the proposed improvements and, and thereafter. Um, the treatment plant is currently fed by an influent pipe, a force main, um, that provides wastewater flows into the plant for treatment, and then treated flows go south and outflow into the Connecticut River. Um, one thing I'd like to mention about the uh, treatment plant is we have some recent relevant project experience here. Uh, the team uh, recently designed the Bill Ricca Mass DPW site, a brand new site, and uh, it actually just broke ground recently, that project. Uh, it's a, it was a pretty, Lofty project, a big site, but a portion of that new site that we moved the DPW to had an existing wastewater treatment plant that was out of operation. So slightly different situation there where it wasn't an active operation, but we learned a lot in just working with the clarifiers, having to pump water out of the clarifiers, working with the ha hazardous building materials that were on that site, um, and working with the leach fields as well to make sure that that portion of the site could accommodate the proposed improvements. So we bring a lot of the knowledge we learned to that site and apply it to this one. In terms of the existing DPW operations on the site, I'd like to start with the uh, existing vehicle maintenance and storage garage in green. Uh, right in front of that are the temporary kind of office trailers. So we understand that the DPW has been headquartered in these office trailers for 20 years. So I think that's a condition that we would certainly you know, be willing to certainly be seeking to improve greatly upon, right, uh, to get some really modern and state-of-the-art uh, internal workspaces for the staff. Next, we have the existing fuel island just south of that, as shown in green. And just south of the treatment plant is the existing pole barn, which we understand not to be uh, climate controlled or heated or insulated. So again, another building that would likely make way for an improved space. And south of that is the existing salt shed. Um, and likewise, if we could improve with a new salt shed that would have uh, a loading ramp and improved efficiency for, for salt storage with the proposed project. So now I'd like to talk about a few environmental considerations for the site. So off to the east are some wetlands uh, associated with the Connecticut, with the uh, the river to the, to the east here, the Fort River. And these are the GIS wetlands that are delineated from Mass GIS. So as part of the project, we would have our wetland staff actually delineate the wetlands. And upon delineating the actual wetland boundaries, we would then delineate a 35 foot no disturb buffer that's required by the Conservation Commission and then the standard state 100 foot buffer. Um, now, if the project proposes any work within the 100 foot buffer, it would trigger a notice of intent application with the Conservation Commission. Um, and we would expect that to happen based on the position of the wetland. Next, I'd like to discuss the riverfront areas. So these just popped up in blue on the plan. Um, the riverfront area, uh, as determined by the state, is defined as area within 200 feet of the bank of a perennial stream or river. So we have the Connecticut River to the west and the south of the site. We have the Fort River to the east of the site. Um, and those kind of impinge the site, as you can see, their associated riverfront areas take up a portion of the site, but not the whole thing. So most of the site is outside of the riverfront area, 
but inevitably there will be a portion of our proposed work that will be inside the riverfront area. That DPW project in Bill Ricca that I mentioned before was also situated right next to riverfront. Um, so in working with that project recently and other projects before it, uh, we have became quite familiar with the uh, riverfront um, regulations in, in the state. And last but not least for environmental considerations here is the Natural Heritage Program or NHESP. This is a state regulating body as part of the, the Mass Wildlife uh, Agency, and they map protected habitat and species areas across the state. And as you can see in this translucent white layer that sh just showed up on the screen, there are several areas around and within the site that are mapped as having priority habitat. Um, so this would involve some sort of collaboration and or permitting efforts with natural heritage. I worked on a site recently with Natural Heritage earlier this year. It was a solar site in Akushnet, Massachusetts that had an eastern box turtle protected on the site. And I found in working on that project that if you coordinate with Natural Heritage staff before it's required, just to solicit some of their recommendations, how you can guide your design to be minimally invasive on the, on the turtle in that instance, it helped us to achieve a lower tier of permitting involvement later on. So that's just some involvement, um, some know-how that we have with Natural Heritage that I think would help the effort on this site. And last but not least, uh, we have several residential neighbors um, around the property. Uh, one thing we always find success in is speaking with the neighbors early on in the process and soliciting their feedback so that we can find out to what extent we can implement that feedback in an appropriate manner for the project. I think one benefit for the neighbors on this project is you see there's a lot of vehicle storage that happens outside uh, the garages in the current condition. Um, the proposed condition would certainly have vehicle storage inside, so that would be a visual improvement. Um, so that takes care of the general project approach from a site constraint uh, perspective. One thing I did like to, I would like to mention is I live in Hatfield. I grew up in uh, Granby, Massachusetts, and I went to school at UMass. So I'm I'm a local guy, and I've been waiting for the opportunity to kind of find infrastructure in my local community that it could contribute to. And this is the first first project in a while, so I'm definitely excited for the prospect of, of working with you all. That's that. Move over to JP. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, JP Parnas, a manager and architect. Um, <clears throat> um, so, uh, just to jump briefly back to the program, Mike uh, uh, suggested that we would do a uh, um, uh, uh, reestablish that program, make sure it's still correct for the current project, the current operations. That study that we did uh, identified a program about a 30,000 square foot. We had a site plan at that point as a concept. Um, we now understand, <laughs> oh, sorry, and that that those broke up into these different um, uh, different departments, uh, administration, vehicle maintenance, wash bay. These are all parts of the program that we want to keep and, and use and verify. Um, and then it's all and Fuel Island. Uh, and then at, at that time, at least the understanding, the, the, the intent was to keep the existing garage uh, as it was. Um, so now with an understanding that you have purchased the, the, the adjacent lot, you know, I think we want to take another look at the site plan uh, based on the uh, data program, but also based on uh, being open mind and, and trying to look at a new, some new idea. So, you know, I, we can take these spaces and and look at a number of different ideas about how to utilize this site in the best way. Um, you, trying to use that new lot, um, I think it does open up a lot of our, a lot of opportunities to consolidate the building better, get a better location for the salt shed potentially, um, and also even add um, uh, potentially a, a canopy out the back, which we weren't able to have before because of space. Um, so just looking at a couple different um, other concepts, again, this is something we want to work through in a lot of detail. <clears throat> so eventually coming to uh, a finalized conceptual design that would allow us to proceed uh, with schematic design. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but there are a number of other factors we want to look at. Uh, Mike mentioned uh, temporary facilities and continuing our operations. We're very aware that you know you have nowhere to move once we do construction on this site, and that we would have to uh, have you continue operations with something we have a lot of experience with. This particular project with Rockport, 
we had to maintain um, a fuel island and maintenance of the back. Um, and then for your um, site, as you're aware, the, the, the main operations we want to keep going are the maintenance building and the sewer operations. Uh, we know that needs uh, large truck access um, as well as staff and parking. Um, so that we can establish, uh, you know, a construction work area that's out of the way and able to uh, allow operations to continue. Again, we have a lot of experience doing this. This happens to be Foxboro, Mass, UPW. It's actually under construction right now. That's their existing maintenance building right there on the left. This is the new facility or the new uh, site work here. They're going to build an addition right at the end here. So it's, it's right on top of them. And we've been coordinating with the contractor. And, uh, to uh, uh, make sure that both operations can happen at the same time. Um, Marshfield DPW was another example uh, where we had to build right next to their existing operations. That's the maintenance base there, those doors. Um, that's actually a good example of a lesson learned as well. Um, uh, Marshfield DPW, we have been developing a, a large DPW plan for them on another site. They decided to buy this existing building and wanted to repurpose it for a portion of their DPW um, and asked us to do an evaluation of that building. We did a very extensive and cautious evaluation, more so, I think, than they wanted, because we ended up suggesting that it would be several million dollars to renovate it. And that, they were not happy about that. Um, and so uh, we kind of backed away from that, turned towards designing a new, smaller facility for them to meet their budget. Uh, and in the meantime, had to also accommodate in, in, within that design um, the uh, uh, existing operations that they had now moved in. They ended up renovating the building themselves and saved a lot of money. Um, this is also an example of uh, they were able to do a lot of site work and we were able to help them um, manage that. That was the beginning of the project to, to manage some uh, geotechnical soil replacements. <laughs> so, so how do we get to that preferred uh, schematic design? We want to get the right cost and the right size. You know, both are an issue and they're sometimes in competing because cost is the biggest issue. <laughs> and we understand that this, you know, like every other town, you're going to struggle paying for a big project. However, I do get a sense that, you know, I think this building is an example. When it's a correct investment and it's sized correctly and people understand it's 450 years or more, that it can be a worthwhile uh, investment and folks will support it. Um, so we will look, you know, we want to look at the best use of that site on how we use that, uh, that new lot um, and how we get an efficient and cost effective uh, building on that site. Um, lastly, uh, communication. Um, that's going to be a really important uh, subject, both with us, with the OPM, uh, with you and the committee, with the DPW, and then internally. Um, we pride ourselves on being a service-oriented firm. We really uh, try to service uh, our clients. One example is uh, a city of Rochester, New Hampshire. Um, I've been working with the DPW director there since 2014. Uh, started a programming study and a site selection study with them. Um, he actually left, worked with the, the other DPW director, then he came back, started the project again. We kept looking at sites for 10 years and finally got funded and got constructed. It was finished last uh, two years ago. Um, extremely successful project, and we've had probably half a dozen projects with that city since then, mostly as a result of great communication supporting them throughout the whole long process. Um, so we're really devoted to that. Uh, internal coordination, uh, just to emphasize again, um, all of our engineering is in-house. So coordinating directly between them and us, us being the architects, uh, is, is, is as easy as getting up and walking to the next desk. At so that's really important to us. Um, we have, we'll have you know, regular scheduled uh, coordination meetings. Um, and QAQC is something that we have been really implementing in the last five years in a very rigorous manner using a shared software platform that allows all the disciplines who are reviewing it to share the documents, see others' notes. There's a, there's a very rigorous um, process for checking off those notes, responding to questions, 
and so on that is uh, very important. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Della to talk about schematic design. Thank you, JP. So we have the program nailed down. We've we've talked about different conceptual site plans. We've identified the preferred. So the next step here is the schematic design process. This is really when the building, the site starts to come to life. Um, it's a it's another phase where communication and coordination is critical. So with the client, with uh, the committees. Um, starting out with some of these site plan uh, schematic layouts, so different arrangements of offices, what offices want to be adjacent to others, the flow of administrative uh, space, um, presenting it, reviewing it, getting feedback from the users, reworking the layout, and, and really trying to hone in on the preferred uh, sense of space, flow of space. So once that preferred layout is is identified, then we really start to coordinate with our in-house disciplines. The um, site civil starts to look at utilities and, and stormwater drainage um, and um, environmental investigation to help inform structural foundations. Our um, NEP FP systems really start to take life and industrial equipment specialists, they'll meet with the mechanics, they'll inventory existing equipment, start to spec out some uh, suggested new equipment They'll put together layouts of that maintenance space. So the deliverable at this point is um, site plans, building plans, elevations. This is also when we start to really dig into the aesthetics of the facility to to fit in with the rural character of the of the area. So building finishes, roof bassing, um, and then also design narrative. So the um, those building systems start to get um, decided to go forward, leading into a more accurate cost estimate at this point, um, and then just getting everyone on that same page going forward. So everything's coordinated and communicated. Our standard practice is a BIM software called Revit. Um, as JP mentioned, this is especially efficient in our office with in-house. I can see all of the LinkedIn discipline models into one singular model. If I see ductwork hitting framing, I can go right to their cubicle and let them know we need to solve this and get to a solution much quicker, I think, than, you know, if you give a call or get a voicemail um, or send an email to a consultant, there's a lag period in resolving that issue. And the 3D software can be great for outreach material, presenting to the community, helping them understand these spaces a bit better. And now... Uh, getting buy-in from, from residents, from committees. And um, I believe that us as architects and engineers, we have this moral obligation to design responsible buildings for the client, of course, for the users, for um, the environment. So some key aspects in terms of cost-effective and functional, um, we pride ourselves on really tight drawings, so come bidding and construction, that we reduce the confusion, the really coordinated drawings. Um, it's right-sized in terms of building systems, right-sizing spatially, functional. And then in terms of resiliency, the definition there is the ability to um, absorb impacts, prepare for threats, adapt to disruptive events. So thinking facility design, building systems, how can this first responder stay operable 24 7 no disruption to um, electricity maintenance functions um, backup power with the generator and then sustainability the the definition there is the ability to provide the needs of today without compromising future ability so thinking you know at site scale stormwater management to protect the water quality in the environment and in the community um, going now into the building, thinking about building systems again, um, energy conservation efforts, different um, energy recovery ventilation systems. Um, the building envelope is is big here as well. Um, I'm working with the town of Acton right now. They're a, a specialized Optin stretch energy code they've adopted. So we're navigating that compliance pathway to really um, super insulate our envelope even under slab where they have radiant flooring in the maintenance block of the facility. Um, and detailing, being very careful with detailing for heat loss to prevent thermal bridging. 
Um, so again, these are these are key aspects, really key focus areas to provide these long term continuous benefits for the client. Um, cost savings, reduced energy bills with energy conservation, energy efficiency. Um, it's beneficial to the users. It's a it's a safer, it's a healthier, uh, more functional space. Um, material finishes that are are low maintenance and durable and reduce maintenance costs, reduce repair costs, and um, beneficial to the environment and the community. Again, things like air quality and and water quality that that this um, type of project could impact for the better or for the worst. Now I'm handing it to Mike to close up the right, section I'll, here. I did that. Um, one, one thing I, I just, I will add there is, is uh, up, up to this point of the project in terms of, you know, getting through the review and confirmation up through the schematic design is really probably the most interaction uh, that we will ask of you guys. You guys can, you know, we'll be looking for a lot of answers from you to make sure that we get it right. Um, we'll help guide you through that process in terms of some of the HVAC systems that you'd be looking for, the electrical systems, the security systems. Um, we want to hear from you. Mo most of our clients are really looking for the most bang for their buck, right? How can we uh, provide energy efficiency uh, without spending a lot of money? That's really what most of our clients are, are looking for. Um, so there will be a lot of interaction. And then once we're in design, usually what we find is just a lot of updates as we go forward. And then we'll be coming to you with, with certain questions as, as they come in. But really, this is the most intense part of the, the whole program and effort or the whole uh, design effort. Um, so talking about total project costs, um, one thing that we, you know, we've been seeing, you see from this graph, is the prices have been increasing faster than what would be normal escalation. And you see 2014 to 2016, it was around 3%. And then we had a moderate increase 2016 to, to 2019. 2020 was interesting. That was the COVID year. A lot of people pulled their, their projects off the shelf for us uh, and, and elsewhere. We had one, one town that decided, let's go forward. Let's, let's see what happens. And they caught it just right. They caught it at a point where, where people were, you know, they didn't know what was going to happen with the market and the contractor went at it aggressively. And, uh, and, and lo and behold, the economy kept going. It kept going strong. And that's why you start seeing this, this price, just these prices on, these are average bid prices. Okay. That's why they start increasing sharply. But what's interesting is you see that line there. And I'll talk about that in a second. That is the discrepancy in pricing that received uh, in 2022. And that's not the kind of a trend that you see going forward. So how do we control total project costs? Well, one thing that we do is we like to try to get you guys accurate estimates, right? We try to guide you through this process. What are you looking for? How much can you afford? And we try to value engineer around what you're looking for. Um, we start off during the conceptual level. We start looking at these historic trends that we see. This is what people have been, have been building. Right. Um, and these are the actual bid costs. Um, we start adjusting. We look at what the trends are. And then we try to address it for your site. Did you go pre engineered metal building? Did you go timber? Is, it, is there ledge? Is there unusual site conditions? Things that might impact the cost. We want to adjust it there at that, at that level. Um, as well as we'll take market adjustments, right? Doing work you know, in 128 versus doing work in the town of Charter where completely different markets, right? We want to adjust for that as well. Um, the next is we get into the design budgets, which would be the schematic design level. Um, we're going to look at this historic data, right? But now what we're going to do is we're going to bring in our independent estimate, right? The process that Della just walked us through, we might not have the design in hand, but we're going to know what those pieces look like. And we're going to have a written narrative. And we're going to be able to hand that to an estimate who will get us a more accurate cost. So we'll take, take that forward. And then we'll reconcile. If, if the OPM does an estimate too, we want to reconcile. Make sure we're all on the same page. The worst thing that could happen for you folks is that we undercut it. We want to make sure that we resize your project. And we don't want to undercut it and, and put you guys in a, in, a, in, a, in a difficult situation. We don't want to be there, right? So... Um, I talked about the discrepancy in pricing, right? So you can see 2014 to 2020, the pricing was relatively tight. Those are multiple projects. That was the high and the low. Um, 
um, pricing. The blue line is, is the average pricing. So you'd see in 2021, you started seeing these prices, a huge discrepancy. It's really, how do you estimate that? How do you, how do you control that? And you'll carry, we'll carry contingencies up to a certain point, but at some point, you know, we will, we'll stop looking at when we know this is going to bid, we'll stop calling around to contractors. We'll stop finding out what else is on the street. We'll try to identify where we are in the market so that we can get you guys the best, best price. So what is causing some of that uncertainty in the market? Well, it's material shortages, right? I think the pre-engineered metal building part is, is, is much better than it was uh, two, three years ago. We're not seeing the long lead times. We're not seeing the huge uh, spike in costs. Um, but there's still other material shortages out there. And those material shortages are causing, causing you know, longer lead times. It's causing the projects to go on a lot longer. We used to estimate these projects about 16 months. Now we're sometimes saying 18 to 20 months, uh, depending on the project. Um, labor shortages, that's another thing that we're seeing. Um, and it all leads to project schedules and, and, and price increases. So what we want to do is we want to try to manage that as much as possible, right? So that's, again, that's why we bring in that independent estimate. Um, we try to produce accurate construction documents, as, as Dell was mentioning. Um, phased construction is something that we've looked at. Uh, we've looked at, you know, early bid packages. We've looked at, you know, hey, let's build this now. You have a master plan to build something in the future. As you know, Scott, that can be a ri risky proposition, right? Your your trailers were, were, were temporary. And here you are, we're 20, <laughs> 25 years later. You don't want to be in that situation. Usually the town will fund it once, and they'll say, hey, we already took care of you guys. You don't need that next phase. So that we, we can help advise you if that, if that comes out. Um, bid alternates, right? What, what can you work with? What can you not? Like, you know, what can you procure later, like a salt shed? Um, you know, what can we do? What can we take out of the bid? And if you get favorable bids, maybe you can implement those, those bid alternates. That's something we, we see very common now. Um, alternative construction types. Um, you know, we talk about CME block, timber, pre-engineered metal building, um, stick built, what, whatever be the case, we can help evaluate that for you to find out what is right for you and what's right for the community. Um, reduce risk, right? We, this is something that, you know, um, I think of the pre-engineered metal building. Um, years ago, it was they, the pre-engineered metal building companies weren't guaranteeing their prices till three weeks prior to delivery. How do you, how's a contractor bid on that, right? He's going to inflate his costs. So at that point in time, we were putting in escalation cost, escalation clauses. You know, steel price increase, you can get some, we can, we can increase your contract price. We're out of that market right now, so you don't have to worry about that. That's just a, an example that we try to hit. Um, project schedule, um, we talked about we have 40 people. Um, Supporting this funding request for, for a springtime meeting, that is not a problem. We have, we, have, we have plenty of time for that. We have the staff. We have these folks are, are available to jump on your project. Um, you know, I, I don't know what else to say about that. Schedule is, is not a problem where we're at, at right now. And with that, that's a real good Dan Tanny. Sure. I won't. I, I know we've, we've eaten into the. Yeah, the that's why I, I went kind of crazy. I'll, I'll leave you with that. So um, I'm not going to go into any specific detail on particular points. I think we've touched on a lot of information here. I'm sure you've got questions about how we emphasize certain things or put certain things together. Um, to summarize it, though, I think we, we, I hope it comes across that we're very excited about this project. We'd love to work down one. Um, and we're ready to start. We're ready to meet your schedule. I think there's some, certainly some challenges ahead, but they're, they're interesting ones. And I think they're ones that can be, can be addressed uh, very positively and successfully for the whole community. So with that, I think there's probably enough of it's enough of us talking. And, you know, I'm sure you'd like to ask questions. You will field them as, as appropriate. You guys have had a long day already. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Very informative. Questions from the group. Yeah, I kind of have a question. Obviously, you're a very experienced company. You brought us to multiple sites to look. How does Weston and Samson take all that information and make it Hadley's? How, how, do you, how are you going to put that together and make us, we're not, you know, Foxborough, we're not Holden, 
or Hadley? How are you going to put all that together and make this Hadley? I'll, I'll start the answer to that just by, by um, going back to one of the earlier slides, which was, you know, this large number of projects that we've done. And we've built, you know, 40 or pushing 50. Now, um, none of the two, no two of them are the same. Every single project is distinctive, is customized and tailored to the town, the town's needs, you know, as we as we best understand them in working with you. So the way we make this a head the project is by listening to head. You know, by understanding what your needs are, what your traditions of how you've already been operating for generations on that site, and make sure that we incorporate that. And we listen to you. We're not going to come in and tell you, you know, oh, we know better. You know, you have this many trucks and this many people. This is the facility you should have. We want to filter our experience through your needs or vice versa and give you a project that's appropriate to the town. And that's not just, you know, does it does it meet the the square footage and the arrangement of spaces and is the garage in the right place, but you know, does it feel right? Does it really answer your needs? Does it look appropriate to the town? You've got a very distinctive landscape in Hadley. And and now, you know, particularly with the trees gone along the north side of your site, you've got a, a classic view down from, from Bay Road across the fields to what's going to be a larger new building. So there's an opportunity there to do something that looks like a building in Hadley, even though it's a modern state-of-the-art public works department. So I, I hope that answers that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's our approach. That's our, our feeling. We, you know, we, we feel bad if we did a cookie cutter and said, oh, yeah, we did that project for so-and-so. It'll fit here. You know, we won't do that. Right. I'm with Dave? Um, well, with your 40 or so DPWs that you guys... Uh, Constructed or, or designed. How many have you put in wash stations for the trucks? And do you use automatic or is it um, just a handheld wand with undercarriage? What's your opinion on those? Probably 80% of them have washes, um, and most of those are what we call kind of a semi automated system where we would have there's an automated undercarriage wash and side washer as you drive in. And then it's a it's a hand operated uh, power wash. Uh, we have done simpler ones. We've done much more complicated ones where it's a full automated truck wash that is you know designed for very large vehicles. Those are expensive and expensive to maintain, and not a lot of communities do them. That, that was for the city of Boston. Are they problems? Yeah. Problematic maintenance wise throughout the year. The complicated ones are. I mean, the automated ones are definitely. Problematic. <laughs> they may, they require people that know how to use it and and maintain it properly and have to have maintenance contracts and so on. Is, is so, there a so-called simple or simpler undercarriage wash that isn't such a problem? Oh, the, the undercarriage wash is quite simple. Sorry, I misunderstood. The, the undercarriage wash is, is simply a row of of nozzles that are in a trough in the in the in the slab, and then a series of spray washers on the sides. It's all just triggered by electric eyes to act. That's that is a fairly simple system. That's pretty common that we put that in because they work really well. I, I will say that it, it sometimes that does get DVD out. It's about um, $75,000 option. We do sometimes be it out, but but what we do find is that it's such a key component to your operations that I mean, for us, we'll add a trench in there. Add whatever infrastructure conduit that you need to make that thing run, so that it can be a pump, plug and play system later. There's really no additional costs, or because the alternative is a handheld undercarriage wash, this kind of little cart that you know, yeah. works okay, but <laughs> not the same. And, and, and um, I assume that you could uh, give us some locations where these are in for five or more years. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. yep. And they're, they're good fun to watch. Because when the truck comes in, there is a lot of water all over the place. Don't walk through it. Yeah, yeah no, 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 no walk through it. Very aware of the conditions and the environment in those in those rooms and those spaces. Uh, so you know, we're it's all galvanized steel. Anything that's exposed, or we try not to expose anything, and we use uh, a plastic liner panels, um, and and you know everything non corrosive, waterproof switches and fire alarms and everything else in there. <laughs> One thing Mike, Mike kind of alluded to there is that that's a key component of an efficient 
you know, cost effective, sustainable facility because, you know, the, the better you can take care of your fleet, the longer it's going to last, the less it's going to cost the community over time. And we can, we can actually give you numbers to show how much you save on maintenance and how much longer the trucks last if you wash them and keep them indoors. So it's, you know, it's, it's expensive. The, car, the wash bay is the most expensive square footage that you're going to build, but it pays back. Okay. Else? You built the, you built facilities since COVID or gone off the price here, I'm assuming since COVID. Yeah. How has your record been for accuracy of estimates versus construction costs? Oh, we like that question. I just went through this. I just went through this. Uh, so it, it, it's less than 2%. It's actually closer to 1%. There. For, for a change, so you're within you're within yeah. you're within two percent of of the actual bids yeah. versus your estimate. Oh, I think oh with the estimate? estimate, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, with the estimate, uh, we're usually like uh, probably actually probably about that too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The estimator tries to aim for the middle of what he thinks the right. bid will be. So you know, typically it's either that or lower. Okay, to take the low bid. Okay. It does pretty well. Yeah, and we we take aim at that price early on. And we won't do a formal estimate until the design is developed to a certain point, but we'll start out knowing the order of magnitude. We're not going to just get, you know, three months into this and say, oh, by the way, it's going to cost X. We'll probably have a reasonable idea of what X, what the range of X is likely to be when we start. What do you say roughly for ballpark price per square foot? Let's let Mike answer. That's an average. I mean, Obviously, the last several projects. Yeah, so the, I just put a price up there, and that was yeah, this, yeah, yeah. So this is this is this is interesting. If you if you look at this, oh, I thought I had the numbers showing here. I think we but should. I, 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 the average, I think, I think, I think the 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 low was five seventy five, and the high was. I thought it was sub eight. Is is where it was. That's What's the green line? The green is projected at at at. Um, Eight percent from twenty twenty three. Okay. Yeah. So the prices are actually dropping a little bit from twenty. We. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> well, don't, don't, don't take that for, for the gospel. But you're seeing somewhat of a, a little bit of a dip in price. You, we, we're we're really excited. We got two bids that are coming out, and uh, we're really excited to see what that is. We're hoping that this is a trend. I don't think we'll see a trend drop, dropping. Okay. Um, this this low bid. Was a very large facility, and it, and there is certainly an economy to scale that is is being recognized on it. Okay. Those are construction costs. Those those are those are construction. Yeah. Those are bid. Understood. Those are bid costs. Plus, yeah. plus soft costs on top. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Soft costs are not added on this. That's what I mean. Yeah. On top. Yeah. 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 So, exactly. so what was your per square foot about? Uh so so this this one came in at at five seventy five. This one came in at it's showing eight. It's showing eight, but I. I it was under eight. Yeah. So that was a hand drawn line. Anyway, so. <laughs> and you, you can see that, you know, 10 years ago, the construction costs were going up roughly at the rate of background inflation. But a whole lot of changes since yeah. then have added kind of a, an additional escalator to construction costs. So, you know, your underlying inf inflation rate comes down, construction costs keep rising. And they probably will. You know, indefinitely, as far as we can see it now, that's driven by demand, that's driven by higher, uh, stricter code requirements, you know, more expensive materials, things that just build into it that are unique to construction. Unfortunately, people have been asking for us to look into a lot of different means and methods of construction. We had one time ask us to look into Oh, foam, 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 foam building, styrofoam. <laughs> cool. Yeah. They only that talk to Cindy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we remain neutral on it. <laughs> you you can put anything you want on the outside. It was interesting. Okay. Um, anything else from anybody? I, I actually just have one question. There was a slide that was up earlier in your presentation on the um, schedule. You projected out the um, sort of the a, a broad interpretation of the pathway forward to town meeting in May, right? right? What does your schedule look like to get to bid? To get to bid. just like assume. Let's assume positive results, sure. locally supported. You know, within thirty to forty-five days of the ATM, where 
released and, and going into design? What does the rest of your design schedule look like and how quickly do we get to market? I think that's probably the bigger the bigger challenge is, as Mike pointed out, getting to town meeting and getting uh, uh, when the warrant needs to be established. That'll be a, another conversation for later. But getting to town meeting with, with a, a, a proper you know, schematic design and cost us we don't see a problem with that. Um, getting to 100% and ready to bid by the end of the year, that's a tighter timeline. Um, I think we'd want to look carefully at it to see just what, you know, um, what the, what the key, uh, bidding dates would be, because we really want to target the whole effort to bidding this project at the most advantageous time for the market. Late in the year, early in the year, winter is usually pretty good. Um, you know, later into the spring of the following year starts to not be so good. So you want to, you want to time it that way. Um, I was going to mention that the, to pull together some of the thoughts we gave you earlier. One of the ways to get there is to make sure that this schematic design effort results in a really robust, what I call basis of design, which is the description of this project. It's the drawings, it's the site plan, it's the outline specifications, it's the programming that everyone has agreed to, the town is you know, fully aware of, very excited about it, and we can stick with it. Because the, the key is when we start into final design, that we're refining things, we're not discovering and changing things very much. So that's, um, yeah. that's sort of a roundabout answer. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 we, we, we've expedited projects before. I think we, I think the, I did, we've done a couple that were around four months to bidding, yeah. uh, maybe, maybe sub four. Um, we can certainly expedite that process. I think one of the things we, we try to look to is, Maybe not, you know, sometimes it's, it's the standard pathway is SD, DB, CD, um, and then bid. And if we can, you know, maybe move DD somewhere, you know, up the ladder a little bit, uh, let us plug along, take on some review time and we can expedite, certainly expedite stuff that way. So, um, yeah. So we, we generally try to plan for nine months. Nine months is safe. Um, nine months from. From the time we get the word go released after yeah, our yeah. approval, but we okay. we we accommodate a lot of different schedules depending on the town. Like I said, we've done it, and you know, so forth. And and there may be some opportunities that we can look into in, in a lot of detail of expediting certain elements of work. There may be uh, early packages such as demolition, site prep, um, build a salt shed, if, depending on where we design it to be. So fueling can be can be accommodated. So a lot of that stuff can happen sooner. Um, that can compress the schedule because then the the remaining portion of the site is clear and ready for the contractor to just to jump into. Um, any, you know, hazmat remediation, anything like that. Advocate multiple bid packages for early work. Possibly. How would you Possibly. sort of get around the whole procurement loopholes? You have to with... look at what they what those. Components are. I mean, doing doing things like earthwork, that's pretty commonly done. Um, hazmat rem remediation is pretty commonly done. A salt shed, you know, we'll see that that you know, and that kind of bleeds into temporary facilities. You know, and that may be that you, you build a salt shed and you use that for some vehicle storage for a few months while you build a new building. So it might, in that case, be better to be part of a general contract. Um, there are a lot of potential pieces that we can, you know, look at and shift around as we approach, you know, what the, what the procurement packages are. But you're right, there is a, you know, we always want to keep our eye on Chapter 149 to make sure we're not, you know, bid splitting. It's splitting. Yeah, yeah. Things like a salt shed, for instance. So that that's usually an item that a general contractor outsources. They don't usually build them themselves, so it doesn't tend to provoke too much, uh, you know, unfavorable interest. <laughs> but that's a good point as to how to kind of strategize that so it number one works well if you're not trying to achieve what's in time for the general contractor to take have control of the site you don't want to overlap so for instance if the town does some work some grading or demo or whatever you want to be sure that they're out of the way before your general contractor starts in
Anything else? No. Sweet. Thank, thank you very much. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank there's, a lot, there's a lot here in this project. We're, yeah. you know, we're, we're, I, I hope it comes across yes. that we're interested in and talking about that. Yes, you are. But that, that has come across. We can, we can start the phone. Dan, could I just ask that somehow you send to me a PDF of your presentation just for the record? <laughs> We've got a few of them left. We've had them for a while, but let's have to see how are a fixed group. So they have a group in the company that does um, quacks, you know, pools and sponge pads and that sort of thing. They had their portfolio for a while. Oh, really? Or yeah. people said it's just online. So this is this is kind of a, a cool little thing. I'll bring it up to you. I'll say that. <laughs> but you can pass it around. I'm jealous. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. Thank okay. you for having us and, and really good luck in your part. Thank you. We we really hope we can we can work with you. Uh, I know JP really enjoyed working with this committee. Thank so you. thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Have a nice day. Good. Yeah. And any questions that you know, think of after this, give us a call. Okay. Okay. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank 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 no how pain how how long this day can be. Good luck. Thank Thanks. you. What, you want this door shut? No, it's in the open. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So, it's, are we allowed to ask your opinion on between the two? Give us your opinion for Hadley. First question I had, and then. So, I think, like I said at the onset of the interviews, I think you're can't go wrong. I'll say that. I think they're both highly qualified firms. Each one of them can do the job. I think they both touched on a lot of themes that were very common within their presentations. Um, the one thing that I felt like, and they, they've done this to me before and other, which is why I asked the question, I felt like they were a little <clears throat> evasive on the overall design uh, schedule. And I think that they hedged their response a little bit <clears throat> for all of the reasons that we talked about. Right? So much of it is driven by owner decisiveness and the speed with which decisions are made, and et cetera, et cetera, a lot of which is outside of their control. So I think they were guarded in their response. I think this one was especially has that when you asked if they could meet the right. timeline. Right. Yeah, they can meet from here to March to May. Right. But and actually, he, he switched. Which, which again, if you if you if if I, I don't I don't I, I am not trying to be predictive, so I don't want to come across that way. But if all they're going to do is spit back out what they've already given you once in part of the feasibility study with some additional refinement, there's no reason that it can't be done by. March, no questions asked. If you came back to them with a completely different program or changed based on what you know about the site now and maybe you think differently about what you thought then, it might be a different answer. So, again, a little bit, they were very guarded schedule wise. Seem that way. Um, so, that was sort of I wanted to ask that question. I was sitting on it from the beginning of the presentation because I knew, I suspected they were going to be couched on their response, and they were. So they didn't surprise me by that. But as I said before, I think as long as you understand that risk, I think they're both very qualified firms. I think from my own experience, 
a lean car will get you to market faster than Weston and Sampson. There's money in that. There's value in that. Weston and Sampson might have a little bit more of a hand-holding and interactive um, work through the design phase, more so than the lean car. I don't know that for sure. I can't say because I've never been through it. But that's that was sort of uh, qualifications aside because I think they're both there. The sooner you get to market, the less you're going to pay. His, history will tell you that. 100 years of construction yeah. in Massachusetts will tell you that. The sooner you get to market, the less money you're going to pay. And I think there's a value to that. Yeah. And the right time of year. Right. 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 Well, they both I, I remember that. when we bid the elementary school, the, the architect was adamant, you want to be bidding by this date. Right. And he pushed and pushed right. to right. get to that date. And son of a gun. Yep. Products that were bid three months later were four or five percent more. It was amazing because yeah. they're you're the beginning of the year and they're hungry because we, they want to get the nose in the door. We absolutely love to bring products to bring projects out on January fifth. Yeah. Contractors are cold. Right. They're hungry. Yeah. And, and and they're like they've got nothing to do yeah. but get shop prices and get and get multiple yeah. you know yeah. it's just it's a great time of the year to bid. And I think you have a slightly increased likelihood of getting to that point in time. Again, assuming yep. local support and whatever else with yeah. with one firm over the other. Yeah. I think you know when they say typical nine months for a design from from get go, right? That means it could be a little shorter, or it could be a little longer, right? If nine months is the average. You can imply that there's time beyond as well as time ahead. So I think you have an equal risk of going one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, I know when you ask, especially these guys about the, the timeline, and they says, you know, they, 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 they seem to have a much bigger hesitation on trying to meet the end of the year than, you know, like Rashad said, oh, we can do it, we can do it. But the, the big guy said he was kind of like, uh, you know. Hmm. Did, did they answer the question about max fee? For this portion of it, they did not. About the what? The maximum max fee that, that, that we can. Yeah, we can. Because see, the first company did, right? The right. The right. The right. The These guys are saying about the did not. No, no, they did not. And I don't think that that's a. I think, I think, I think it's uh, to their credit that they read the RFQ thoroughly mm -hmm. and acknowledged that that was a sort of a condition by the town. I think that's a very important distinction to make. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, if they can't do it, you have the right to move on and go to your other candidate. Yeah. And, yeah. and sort so of just like, just like we, I'll be honest, just, just like we did with CNS, we, we interviewed number one and they were adamant that we can't do it for that. Okay, after doing what we did, we moved on and we're with this company. I mean, these guys have a little bit of a head start because they've worked on it. You would think they would be, I mean, they did accomplish some stuff and they did reiterate it, but it's like, okay. Now, I, I was getting the feeling that they figured they had a good idea of what they wanted to do and just move some blocks around. Yep. And um, I don't know, I don't know if they were going to think outside of that last year's box, you know, to see what we need to do, especially now we got more property. Yeah, um, one of the comments is, yeah, absolutely, it's going to be a change. After thinking about it, <clears throat> we really don't want a two-story office building. We've right. got a little bit more property. We want one story because of there's there's enough added upfront costs for an elevator, but the long-term maintenance costs can be significant. Right. And why put in something yeah. if we can it's, avoid it? And the other thing is, you know, some of the places they were putting stuff, they didn't really rethink it with the added, like the salt shed still over on the other side, which is now there's a small wetlands there that yeah. we've created. You know, so, I mean, granted, they've met with us and sat with us, and this other company, I think, is very well, very good. I mean, they're starting from zero. So yeah. that might be to our advantage. Yeah. Of, yeah. They're going to listen to us, you know, 
we've yeah. got a different scope on it now, and, and, and they're going to be coming at it fresh. At least I would say there's a greater likelihood that you're going to have the opportunity to answer all of the questions again. Right. Rather than have a presupposition of what they, right. what you want. They're coming in with what You're going to get a fresh bite for every time. Now we're going to try to correct, whereas before we're starting on a clean yeah. slate. Yeah. See, what I took is this is the open pocket. I say I have five awesome employees here, very professional, but it, you know, you didn't, price wasn't an object, that's what they're going for to give you. It didn't seem like that. Whereas the other one seemed to be more down to earth, they're going to give it, it's going to make the time frame. Um, kind of like the contractor that the, the has five estimators and the one single general contractor does it all on his own. That's what uh, HKA seemed to me that, you know, for, that's more of a fit for happy in my opinion. Well, I mean, it was, it was a lot of dollars per hour sitting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, if there was an old pocketbook, right. that, that's where to go. Like, where to get the, you know, like the money for best for the buck. I think we, I really, it's impressive with it. HKA. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do we want to? Well, yeah. I think there's one part of this problem, too, that Wes and Samson is going to be a big help on that they know about. The others may not. We got to contend with that water main. Yeah. That's in there. They deal with that. Yep. Yeah. That's going to be a big chunk of this project. We got to figure out how to get that done. Well, HKA, don't they have um, subcontractors that would handle that? No, I'm sure. I'm just, but these guys, we already work with them. They already know our system. Yeah. It's, they have True. all our information, et cetera, on, on another level of you know operations. Yeah, but, but I mean, they, they would be made. Would, I mean, the new architect is going to have. Would be would be, be aware. Well, well, made, well aware of that. The very first meeting that yeah, you, you if if we choose HKM, would you say that that okay? You said about the water main. Yes, we have an adequate sewer line. However, the water main serving this section of the street is inadequate. It will not support a sprinkler system. So we're going to run from Bay Road to this place with a new water line. And that project is going to be a cost in its own. It's going to, not going to affect right. the building. Right. No, but, it, but it's going to be yes, we, we, maybe. Well, it's going to be a cost. It's going to be a cost. It's, it's not one company or the other is not going to make a difference as who's doing well, it. Oh, no, that's true. Yes, yeah. But it should be added in the overall project. Might be. Maybe. Or done before. Yeah, we're, not, we're, not gonna have that, 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 we're not sure how that's going to plan out. Plan out, whatever the word is. Okay. Okay. Anybody, anything else on this? I, 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 I personally think that overall time frame is a time frame, whatever. If they can be pushed, I think we're going to get a better product out of Western Samson. Okay. We want to discuss more. Make a vote. Make a vote. Plus, they already have a lot of the information where they're not starting from ground zero. We already know, you know, the changes we should be making already. Okay. And he said he's going to re kind of start from ground zero again, but. To me, it was, yeah. The, the groundwork's already done with them. Do we want to go on the, I mean, I have a big, I mean, I was, well, the way the other company laid it out too, that was quite a layout that they laid out. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, they didn't get into detail, but they showed where stuff could well, go. Yeah. Well, why don't we just go around the table and say who we'd rather have? That's right. That's right. I want to make sure we want to make a vote and then we can talk about who we want and then we can make a formal vote on it. Okay. So, do you want to make, we want to, okay, Tom. I, I HK, I thought. So that's okay. Yeah, HKA, I will go. Samson. Okay. HKA. I'm leaning towards HKA too. Um, I was just, I, I, I just thought it was, they seem, I mean, both companies could certainly do the job. I don't think anybody's disagreeing with that one bit. Um, I just think maybe the smaller company would be a bit more attentive to our needs. I mean, the one thing that, I was kind of impressed with HKA was, and it was one of the questions was lessons learned. Samson really didn't give any lessons Not learned. Late, they, well, you know, they go back and look at everything. But I mean, these guys came up with the 48 foot knee walls and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, uh, you know, what, what, what I liked about their presentation on the lessons learned is things that we, we thought were good and that we wanted to see, they, they re reiterated it that, you know, 
they, they said, yeah, th we thought these were good ideas, and they thought they were good ideas. Not that there was any earth-shattering thing right. about them. I mean, they're, from my point of view, a lot of were common sense. However, there's probably plenty of places that, oh, we can cut a few bucks here. With oh, yes, they're saying, yes. spend the extra money on this, a couple of bucks here, spend a couple of bucks here, because if you don't, 10 years down the road, you're going to be more than spending that kind of money. I think the you know, costs will be their projected square footage costs. They're both, they're both pretty much right. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're both basing it on experience and that's fine. That's good. But which is good about that. At least they're both very close. Right. To which things that that totally in. gives you the, you know, there wasn't a big difference. So the, the only thing that I, you know, I get, was that a, a formal vote that we took? No. No. Okay. Yeah. We had not that taken a formal vote. Okay. The only thing I, I had in favor, big favor of these guys was they seemed to know about a lot of those wash stations that some were painted in there and some were not. Um, so I guess now that what that amounts to is maybe we got to do more research or somebody somehow well, we, I think, we could go with HKA because he was pretty negative about the automatic of it. And maybe well, I, was, I think maybe when, well, he, when you talked about automatic, he may have understood what JP said, a fully automatic car wash, right, a fully yeah, automatic car wash it. is yeah. a nightmare. I can see that because it's, yes. it's so much automation yes, you know, that as soon as the swivel arms aren't maintained, right. whatever that means, they're no longer swivel. So you're shooting a ceiling, you're shooting a wall, but the truck is over here. Right. Whereas the, the semi-automatic, okay, it goes through an, you've got an undercarriage and a couple of side washes that are photo wide driven. And beyond that, it's all basically handheld if you're, yeah. Because if it's fully handheld, I don't see people using it as much as should be done. Oh no, yeah, it's, it's got to be the, the semi automatic. Every time you go to buy a piece of equipment, what do you hear at town meeting? Is that correct? Yeah, why is it rotten out? So, yeah. but like if they said the biggest thing, and they did, had one that was a beautiful truck wash place in Holden, the under the undercarriage wash. Yeah, and, you know, I don't care how much you wash the top; those trucks are rotten from the frames. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Want to make a motion to recommend one or the other? I'll make a motion for HK. I'll second it. Okay, motion second. Any further discussions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, motion passes four, four to one. Motion, you, uh, yeah, four one HKA is our choice. First choice. I will, first choice, I will notify. Well, I, actually, I'll get on your agenda for the selectman's warrant in Two weeks, I think, on the agenda, and uh, asked them to have to verify this, and then we will sit down with HKA and get a negotiation and move forward. That is the process. Is that correct, Mr. Neal? It is. Mm -hmm. Do we have to vote if it didn't work to go with Weston Samson, no. or is it just you automatic? Would, you would by default. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Get yeah. 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 Each well, you okay, why don't, you, why don't you make a motion that uh, a motion there's... if this doesn't work out to go with uh, Weston Sampson as a second. Okay. Second. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. Okay. Yeah. So basically, we have nothing, uh, no reason for meeting until after select board meeting. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll post, I'll post the meeting in case everybody wants to show up for the select board. Um, no, mm -hmm. then we got to, then we actually got to convene a meeting. Maybe not. All right. No, I'll just hope I will not post a meeting for that. Anybody's welcome to attend that meeting. Um, I'll make what we just talked about here. I'll tell the board of selectmen. I'm sure that they'll support us, and then we'll look at negotiation. And I will post that meeting. It'll probably be the first meeting. It'll be the first Tuesday in November, which is six. The sixth. The sixth. Yep. Okay. And then let's see. My calendar. Okay, so the meeting would be the sixth, and I will. Find out how soon we could meet, meet with HKA um, after that and schedule a meeting. I don't want to, I want to make sure, hmm, probably should do it right after that. 
if we could. Um, can I, well, I don't know if I, I, I need clarification on what the committee is authorized to ask HKA to do between now and the 6th as the top rank candidate. Are you looking for them to provide a fee proposal for you to take to the select board? Assuming their affirmative vote of this committee's recommendation, yes, you will. You will have a fee proposal. We we we, we can request a fee proposal okay. from them. Yes. Okay. Would you like me to do so? Or would you? Yes, like please. So? You are much more fluent with that than we. Okay. So I will have them address uh, to your attention, town administrator, Act. and copy me. Right. Yes. Right. Acting. Okay. Yes. So at this, all that goes well, when would our next, you recommend our next meeting here? Um, assuming. Assuming that. So that we can move on this, if the meeting is the 6th, would we be available on um, the seventh, possibly during the day. I won't. You won't. Okay. When I'm going to see my son in Arizona from the seventh to the eleventh. Oh, you're going to lose holiday. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Okay. The thirteenth of November. Right. Everybody available? Could say. Yeah. Find out what time they're available. Um, where they where they, where's HKA coming from? Broughton. What? Broughton. Broughton, Mass. Four ninety five. Any ideas? You know where it is? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like almost to Lowell, but not quite. Yeah. On four ninety five. I know. I know Broughton. Littleton, yeah. Route Two, right around. That yeah, area. Five hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of them will probably be in in Whitman in the morning, but we can fly to Tonker and. Greg can move able on the 13th. When? I was going to find out. When? Uh, I could probably do a late afternoon appointment. Wednesdays are not great for me. Thursday afternoons, anything after. 11 13 is a Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would call that. 30. Four o'clock. Are you available at four? Yeah, I could probably do that. We'll pencil in the 13th at 4. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yes. Now be here. Okay. Well, that would give us plenty of time. As long as the select board approves the uh, on eleven six track <clears throat> or the proposal, they would meet on eleven thirteen with HKA, probably for uh, the kickoff. Okay. Yeah. Our meeting for the next night, fourteenth, right? Oh, sugar! Can you do it today? Let me request. Fifteenth area. I think four. Yeah, right. The what? Town meeting form. Tell town. Uh, the that's town right. meeting warrant on the third form. Form, yeah. I think that's at seven o'clock. Yeah. Oh, seven o'clock. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah that'd be later. Yeah, we, we would be done by then. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Even if it's six o'clock, would be done. I don't think I can't imagine even the kickoff lasting that long. I would hope not. Get moving on. Especially it. Neil, he'll be pushing us out the door at five thirty. Say, let's go. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So we're still maybe the thirteenth at four p.m. Correct. Put the objections and everything else. Verify all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Motion's adjourned. Yeah, second. Second. Motion to adjourn. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.